Yasim Yasim. Jen dva, jen dva, test, test, jen dva, test, test. Čuješ me nutra? Čekaj, sad ću ja svoje. Jedan, jedan, jedan. Dvojka, dvojka, dvojka.
Čujete nas dobro?
ja vas sve lijepo pozdravljam. Moje ime je Dražen Šimleša i tu sam ispred udruge Zelena mreža aktivističkih grupa koja organizira sedmu po redu konferenciju o dobroj ekonomiji. Trebamo početi zato što naši gosti iz Belgije mogu točno u ovom terminu koji su zatražili pa ćemo sve koji nam se od naših domaćih trebaju pridružiti, pridružit će nam se poslije. Lijep pozdrav svima, znači ovo je sedma po redu konferencija, ove godine sa specifičnim fokusom o tome na koji način gradovi mogu biti akteri društvene i solidarne ekonomije. S obzirom na ovu situaciju, poklopilo se sa ovim izborima, ali zapravo je nama ovo završetak projekta Partnerstvo za društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju koje smo provodili u suradnji sa gradovima Ludbregom i Pregradom i uz potporu Komore za društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju iz grada Ženeve. Tako da će nam i oni reći neko svoje iskustvo šta su naučili tokom ovog projekta, a danas smo skupili goste iz Evrope i svijeta koji primjenjuju društvenu solidarnu ekonomiju i skupili smo predstavnike gradova koji po nama su na dobrom putu da mogu jednog dana to postati, odnosno imaju već sada provode brojne politike koje su dio društvene solidarne ekonomije, a koje se nalaze u području energetike, energetske učinkovitosti, gospodaranja otpadom, podrške lokalne proizvodnje hrane, transparentnog upravljanja gradom, otvorenom komunikacijom sa građanima i uključivanjem građana u procese donošenja odluka, znači sa svim sastavnicima koje su bitne za društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju. Ja dalje neću dužit, jer imamo goste iz Belgije, znači prvi gost na današnjoj konferenciji i molim vas što se tiče rasporeda, znači raspored je zaista bio uvjetovan sa slobodnim terminima našim inozemnim gostima koji nam se javljaju, pošto su, kao što i svi znate, već svi na ovakvim eventima online i dosta su zauzeti. Današnji prvi gost je dogradonačelnik grada Agenta, gospodin Bram van Brakeveld. Ono što je zanimljivo, on je dogradonačelnik zadužen za turizam, rad i društvenu ekonomiju, znači kod njih je to spojeno, i on će nam zapravo ispričati jednu zanimljivu priču na koji način je jedan grad koji je zaista imao ogromni turistički boom, bio, možemo reći, i ovisan u turizmu, kao i mnogi gradovi kod nas, pogotovo na obali, na koji način su se oni išli upravljati sa tim sektorom za vrijeme COVID-19 krize, kako bi on bio održiviji, dugoročniji i na korist stanovnika agenta. So, jesu oni ispojeni? Nisu? Aha. Mr. Bram van Brekeveld, can you hear us? Jel nas čuju uopće? Uh, Bram, can you hear us? Ah, Els, you are with us. Yes, but I think Bram is coming in. Ah. Yes, I see him now, so I'm Only. leaving. <laughs> ah, okay. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Bram. Welcome. Uh, so, uh, regarding your time, I uh, uh, introduce uh, you a little bit, but you can also say something if you want. The floor is yours, and thank you very much uh, for taking time for our uh, Good Economy Conference in Croatia. It's a pleasure. Um, I would like to say uh, 
that I'm very happy to be in Croatia, but <laughs> I will. I hope that next time I can be there uh, physically as well to enjoy your beautiful country. Uh, nonetheless, um, now it's my turn to say welcome in Ghent. Um, it will be for a couple of minutes, but uh, in short, um, uh, I will uh, um, tell you maybe something about myself very briefly. Um, my name is Bram, Bram van Brakeveld. I am a deputy mayor on labor market, uh, public cleanliness, uh, social economy, human resources uh, policy for 11,000 employees at the city of Ghent, and of course, uh, tourism. Um, I've been uh, deputy mayor since uh, January 2019 uh, for the Green Party, and I've been uh, contacted uh, to tell you about a bit more about the story of uh, our Ghent tourism of the future ambition uh, with a focus on sustainable adaption for tourism uh, post uh, COVID, um, because uh, the baseline is that we do not want to go back to the tourism boom as was coming to Ghent, but we have we want to have a balance uh, with the city and our citizens. So uh, uh, let me take you for a, a short tour uh, around Ghent, maybe uh, because I don't know if you uh, know Ghent. Um, we have around a quarter of a million inhabitants, and we are uh, a half uh, hour away by train uh, from Brussels Central. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Lonely Planet rated Ghent as Euro's, Europe's best kept secret, uh, and I'll uh, I'll show you why. Uh, first of all, we have a medieval castle in the in the heart of the city. Um, I don't know if uh, the slides are following else. Yes, so I don't know. Uh, we have a medieval uh, castle in the heart of the city. It's called the Gravenstein else. Uh, we have, uh, of course, our uh, restored um, uh, Ghent altarpiece uh, um, uh, painted by Van Eyck. We have uh, three beginnings, uh, which two of them are uh, on the UNESCO World Heritage uh, List. We have modern uh, architecture. Uh, this is called by the Gentians the sheep stable. And of course, we have uh, our winning light plan. Um, but most importantly, um, for Ghent, are the Gentians themselves, uh, is the city uh, of which we are very proud, um, the vibe, uh, the inhabitants, but also, of course, the people who come to visit our city, students and uh, uh, tourists. Um, about our policies, uh, maybe short. Um, it's very appealing to visit Ghent, of course. Uh, but um, when I started as deputy mayor, um, we asked ourselves, how can we uh, create policies in an international market that tourism is? Um, and how can we uh, change the policy so that the little um, policy decisions that we have as a local city how can we use them uh, at a maximum scale to make sure that um, our city can uh, stay authentic Ghent? Um, because maybe I'll show you the, the, um, the evolution of the overnight stays. Um, when I saw this graphic, it made for me very clear at the beginning of um, the start when I became deputy mayor, that we had to be very careful um, to make the right uh, decisions uh, concerning tourism. Because, um, of course, this is before there was anything about around COVID, but we were very afraid that uh, we couldn't cope as a city uh, the growth of the uh, overnight stays. Um, so uh, what we did to maintain the good balance between the tourism that we would like to have and a sustainable city is um, we started um, a fundamental debate and question uh, with the inhabitants of our city, the touristical entrepreneurs, and we posed the question, will uh, tourism and tourists have the monopoly 
in Ghent. Uh, it's a bit uh, dramatic uh, the way we, we, put, we put the question, but for me, the most important thing was let's have a debate and make sure that uh, we can uh, start our sustainable policy in the future. Uh, so we had a three month uh, during participation process uh, about the future proof tourism in Ghent. Uh, and uh, the first evening we had a kind of debate with citizens and the local tourism sector that was in November 2019. And the final report was delivered at the 12th of March um, and the day after Belgium went into lockdown uh, because of COVID. Um, what was very clear um, during the debate or after the debate as conclusion is that um, if we want to have a future, a future proof tourism policy, uh, Ghent has to be, our policy has to be absolutely sustainable, um, something typical only in Ghent, um, accessible to all and uh, we should keep all stakeholders involved so we don't have to listen only to the um, uh, touristical entrepreneurs but we have to make it a, a city um, uh, no something that the city as a whole um, has something to say about so that's very um, important uh, so that to keep all the stakeholders involved um, maybe a bit more about what we think about uh, sustainable tourism. Um, we started a couple of actions uh, before uh, COVID started uh, to make sure that um, our policy can be sustainable. Uh, for example, uh, we wanted, uh, we started with an Airbnb stop because we know that uh, the more Airbnbs in our city, the more the houses, uh, the prices of the houses will stay, uh, will, uh, Will, um, will grow uh, and the less affordable it, it is to buy a house and also it has a great impact on the, um, the way of living in, in our city. Um, we uh, promoted the fact that uh, tourists are very welcome to take their time. Uh, so don't just come and take your selfie and leave again. No, take your time, stay a few days. Um, but we also uh, planned also another, uh, another another um, type of actions such as uh, promoting the green key, promoting fair BNB. Um, we are currently working uh, on an, uh, um, a stricter permits about uh, building in our historical city center. Um, we are a veggie uh, capital, uh, so we, we will keep promoting that, uh, but also in all kinds of transportation we are looking for um, to make to make sure that uh, it can be all uh, more sustainable. Um, that was before uh, COVID. Uh, then came COVID. Um, so uh, from the 16th of March, against Ghent was really like kind of a ghost uh, city um, until June. Uh, but um, we have to be honest; uh, it still is not the same kind of. Uh, liveliness as we as we knew it before. Uh, this has uh, a huge impact, uh, a loss of turnover. Uh, we expect a lot of failures um, from going from bars, shops, restaurants, but also um, we are afraid of unemployment. Uh, we know that 7,000 jobs are linked uh, to tourism and um, we know that only in the hotel sector uh, there are 700 uh, people uh, temporarily unemployed uh, with risk of uh, unemployment. So we, it's, that has, a, of course, not only in Ghent, but also in Ghent, a huge impact on the liveliness. Um, maybe to make that a bit more clear, um, we had 72% uh, less, uh, percent less uh, visitors on our attractions. We had 60% um, less uh, visitors in our tourist information center, uh, and um, we had uh, seven, 75 less uh, percent less overnight stays. Um, so uh, that is, of course, a, yeah, a very big, big impact, uh, also economically. Um, we 
quite quickly started rethinking uh, the reboot of tourism. So um, in May 2020, we started uh, to have conversations with the colleagues, uh, policymakers, um, and we made also uh, sure that we want to make a couple of steps forward, but not by uh, falling into the same uh, traps or problems from the past. So we are not uh, going back. We are not. Uh, we are jumping uh, to the future-proof and sustainable tourism, balanced with the city and its citizens. Uh, so I, I like to call that a fast forward to the outcome of the of the citizen debate. So actually, COVID was for us a very big problem and with huge expectations and uh, um, uh, and also for the city big question how can we cope that but we used this great crisis um, to really aim for the future and for a future proof uh, policy around uh, tourism so uh, we, we made a plan for three years um, we uh, invested 1.5 million euros uh, with three main objectives uh, and only in Ghent marketing and of course every city wants to say that that city is unique and uh, you have to visit only this, that, that kind of city. Um, of course, that's, that's all true, but uh, the great exception is Ghent, where it is really, really, really true. Um, uh, then also we had to make uh, sure that we had a Corona-proof product design. And of course that evolves during um, what we knew about Corona and COVID as well. And, uh, um, but we uh, invested in spreading of tourism uh, to all the beautiful spots that we had in Ghent and not only in the city center, but also uh, visitable by bike or uh, by foot. Um, and we promoted a higher level of sustainability in the tourist uh, lodging and attractions. And also uh, important for Ghent, we are an academical uh, city, but we, we have an university, but also um, uh, we have North Seaport uh, as an important economical uh, uh, factor. So we, um, we uh, combined our forces uh, to make a Corona-proof International uh, Congress policy um, so that we, uh, we don't go back to uh, lots of traveling for only a couple of hours of uh, physical uh, contact. Uh, so we invested in the, those three main objectives to make sure that uh, um, uh, we used Corona as a future-proof uh, policy. Uh, one of the examples of only in Ghent marketing was uh, the, which involves all the stakeholders in Ghent and uh, tourism, including the Gentians. Is the next slide? Voila, uh, that's uh, that's uh, an example uh, because uh, uh, to show you how we did it. Um, we also uh, worked. Uh, as good as possible together with our uh, regional government um, who uh, uh, also promotes uh, the important cities uh, in Flanders uh, and in Belgium. And um, um, we also organize, organized a digital event with all professionals on, um, uh, on the, uh, the, the 9th of March um, so that um, this year, uh, so that we can inform them about the financial measures that we have uh, taken uh, to help and survive COVID on the one hand, but also to ask them what, what are their priorities now at this moment. And um, we are very happy to see that uh, the conclusions of our city debate about the, the, the future of tourism and even with COVID, um, in the middle of, of the crisis, uh, the expectations are still the same. So now we really hope uh, for tourism to revive and we are more sure that we will be on a most more balanced and sustainable uh, way. So that, that makes me very happy as a deputy mayor of tourism. Um, and it makes me happy to see that uh, our stakeholders are still uh, on track uh, with a focus on a sustainable way to restart our tourism uh, activities. So that, 
that in a nutshell, um, I hope I've been uh, in time uh, or in the time schedule. Uh, I like to keep it short so that uh, I can hear if, if there were some questions, because uh, I like to talk a lot, but I can imagine that there were a couple of questions. But um, um, I hope that it explains a bit um, how we uh, how we undertook um, our, how, or uh, how we started uh, uh, better set um, our mission for a sustainable tourism uh, uh, policy in Ghent, how we tried to um, uh, take the COVID uh, period as an uh, opportunity to go even further and more and on a more faster uh, matter than we had planned to make sure that um, in 2022 or 23 when we really will see the reboot of tourism uh, to make sure that it will be in a more sustainable way than uh, when we started in January 19. Thank you. Thank you, Bram. Ako imate neka pitanja, slobodno možete postaviti. So, uh, Bram je još s nama 10 minuta. Thank you, Bram, for this. Uh, this is really um, interesting uh, approach and inspiring. Uh, maybe to answer on um, two questions, uh, because this is also part of your uh, field of work. What is the role of social economy in this uh, process regarding tourism, if there is any? And, may, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, now we are in the crisis, but um, can you foresee how you will manage basically if uh, the crisis with uh, COVID-19 stops and all of these uh, tourists want to come back, you know, to Ghent in uh, uh, huge numbers? Uh, and basically, as you said, you have this financial uh, you know, um, uh, falling down, so people will want to recover. How you will manage this process to 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 save it in this sustainable future-proof uh, concept, and you know, to not skip away uh, from your uh, uh, approach. So these are two questions for now. Thank you. Um, I will try to answer them briefly. So um, social economy and tourism, uh, for the moment, it, it's not really um, strangled with one another. Um, what I see is that there are a very, um, no, a lot of people without um, uh, certificates or, or uh, people who don't get uh, um, jobs very easily they are working in hotels they are working in restaurants so for people without with, with not the highest uh, education um, for them tourism is very important because they are working um, at, in the sector um, so that's very important what we see with the social economy is that uh, we are trying to make some links um, in production and also uh, a production on a very typical Gentian way. Uh, for example, we had a very important uh, Van Eyck year, uh, year. So Van Eyck is uh, our Flemish, uh, a very important painter um, uh, who has an, an altarpiece in the, in the cathedral. And we made uh, a touristical year 2020, but of course uh, we only uh, had that for the first three months. So we, with uh, the promotional banners that we created, um, the social economy made uh, handbags, for example. So we try to, when we can strangle it together and make a win-win situation, we, we will try to do it. But uh, as a responsible uh, deputy mayor for labor market, for me, tourism is also um, a very important approach to make sure that people without the best education still can work in the in the best uh, in the best uh, labor conditions uh, so to respond to your second question that is why um, uh, we may have to make sure that uh, the evolution in tourism is a stable one and not one that uh, rises or falls very quickly um, because 
when you uh, rise or fall very, very quickly, um, for example, with COVID, uh, the, the change of heart is possible uh, with the inhabitants. So um, it's very important that there's also a balance with inhabitants and people who come to visit, uh, not only tourists, but also students. Uh, and um, as long as that balance is okay, you will see that there is an, uh, a way of living together and that's very important. But uh, our inhabitants have to see as well, and that is what we are doing, that we protect the liveliness of our city um, by not uh, importing uh, and, and crying out for tourists uh, at the same time and not importing on a great scale. So one of the decisions we had made um, is uh, that cruises will be limited. Uh, hotel, uh, hotel, uh, hotels cannot uh, build whenever or wherever they want. Uh, so th th those are, the, are examples or on how a local um, city can decide um, and, and have an impact on um, on balance and on uh, uh, yeah the right um, uh, uh, how to say the right balance with, with with inhabitants and and tourism on the same on the same level. We are checking out the numbers that are uh, prognosed by uh, the UN WTO. So that that's the um, uh, the great institution on tourism uh, from the UN. Uh, but of course, our um, our uh, lockdown measures are very important as well. And so we hope that on the 8th of May, uh, our uh, bars can be opened again. Um, so, and we hope that once everyone has a vaccine, um, that uh, this summer uh, tourism in Europe can be possible uh, and so that we can make the growth um, uh, ha happening again. But of course, it's very difficult eh, because we all know that uh, uh, it's not easy to uh, predict how COVID uh, 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 will evolve, but it's very difficult. And that is why we also uh, work together with our um, regional uh, authorities and uh, uh, the federal ones. Uh, but we try to make uh, some labor market um, uh, measures ourselves as well. Uh, for example, uh, people who want to change their career they can follow uh, uh, for free and get um, training about that, uh, stuff like that. So we really try to be hands-on um, to make sure that we don't lose anyone in this corona, in this COVID crisis. But of course, uh, a local uh, uh, a local city can do not all of that alone. We have to work together also on European level to make that possible, of course. Great, thanks. Uh... Do we have any more questions for Bram? Okay, once more. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Marco. I'm from the Association of Cities. Thank you for your uh, presentations. Presentation already, uh, although you already mentioned some um, answer. Um, I would like to pose a question. Uh, are you already foreseeing any uh, concrete measures or incentives uh, for local economy and local stakeholders uh, regarding this this three-year plan uh, of uh, reboosting the tourism. So you mentioned this requalification, but are you also foreseeing some some other uh, measures? Thank you. So what we um, plan to do with that um, 1.5 million is, uh, uh, for example, investing in our local. Uh, boat uh, economy and we have uh, Ghent is known by uh, two great uh, water flows, um, the Leia and the Schelde. Uh, so we uh, promote also uh, traveling by boat. Um, and uh, one of those measures is to make the, the boats uh, more sustainable. Uh, but um, one thing that for me is very important as well is investing in fair BNB. I don't know if you know it, but it's a kind of cooperation of uh, people who want to welcome tourists in their homes, uh, who gain a bit money of it. But and that's very important. Uh, the money that they gain, a part of that money goes back into the local economy. Uh, so for me, that's a very great example on how uh, tourism and local cities and local inhabitants can reinforce themselves on a sustainable manner. 
Um, I don't know if that was those two examples were a concrete uh, answer to your question, but um, the mo how to say we uh, we um, uh, have a good uh, dialogue with um, the hotel owners in our in our city, and we all feel that 1.5 million is a lot of money, but on the same time, um, it's not enough to like you know uh, distribute. Uh, um, on all the uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So we uh, try to, uh, on a Ghent way, um, to invest very smart in good promotion, not too much, not on a too large scale, but uh, um, very well focused and also uh, with uh, the light on our sustainable way of tourism. So, um, I hope that's a bit of an answer uh, to your question. Okay, one more question before next guest we have. Okay, if not, thank you really a lot, Bram, for uh, for this uh, lecture and uh, basically for your really innovative and a holistic approach in this uh, very affected sector like tourism. Thank you uh, very much and hope to Thank see you, you in Ghent Thank or you Croatia. So much. <laughs> yeah, you're all welcome in Ghent. Thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk about my home city, but it's also a pleasure uh, to get to know you. Uh, unfortunately, this, would, <laughs> this is not possible today, nor live, but uh, maybe uh, next time I'm really uh, looking forward to it. I wish you all the best uh, for your conference. And um, like I said, hopefully uh, we will see each other later on. Bye bye. Bye, take care, stay healthy. Okay, mi sad nastavljamo. Možemo reći, nastavljamo u revijalnom tonu, jer će nam se obratiti gospodin Marijan Gregorović sa dogradonačelnim grada Ceresa. To je isto za nas dobar primjer da vidimo kako je jedan grad u primjerju, znači na obali, koji također je povezan sa turizmom. Na koji način se oni brinu za lokalni razvoj, za kvalitetu života? Pa evo, gospodine Gregorović, izvolite. Je, je. Pa evo, lijepi pozdrav svima. Ja evo, moram priznati da nisam pripremio prezentaciju jer sam e, mislio da će ovo biti nikako više kao panel, ali nije to ni važno, mogu vam govoriti bez, i bez prezentacije jer mislim da imam dovoljno informacija koje s vama mogu podijeliti u glavi. Ja nadam se evo, da, da će vam to biti zanimljivo i da, da možda možemo oko, oko nekih ideja ili e, procesa i debatirati. Dakle, da, grad Sres je, odnosno... Grad Ceres i ono što ono buhvaća, otok Ceres, za vas možda koji to ne znate, je najveći otok u Republici Hrvatskoj, bez obzira što kolege iz Krka govorili, sad ih ovdje nema, tako da oko toga sigurno neće biti debata. Ono što ubuhvaća grad Ceres, to je površina od 292 km2, a to je to vam znači da smo mi najveća prostorna, najveća jedinica lokalne samouprave na području dviju županija, Primorsko-Goranske i Istarske županije. Jedna nezgodna stvar po nas, na Ceresu živi nešto ispod 3000 ljudi, dakle mi po ovaj, gustoći naseljenosti na, ovaj, smo među najnenaseljenijim što se tiče isto tako te dvije županije. Sad ono što je, to je nama ujedno na neki način i prednost u smislu e, e, oblikovanja javnih politika da možemo uključiti zapravo gotovo čitavu cijelu zajednicu u neke procese, a s druge strane održavanje komunalne infrastrukture puno skuplje kad se nađete u situaciji da imate e, neko naselje u kojem živi svega dvoje ili troje ljudi, a vi za to naselje isto tako trebate osigurati svu onu infrastrukturu koju ti ljudi zaslužuju, a ipak to, to iziskuje velike troškove. Što se tiče grada Cresa i priče o dobroj ekonomiji, ja bih rekao da smo mi negdje na pola puta. Dakle, početci toga, mislim, rekao bih da sežu negdje od 2010. godine, 
kad je pilot projekt lokalnog razvoja, kad se koncipirao u suradnji s Ministarstvom kulture i uz partnerstvo Vijeća Evrope, tada je grad Sres odlučio krenuti u smjeru zapravo koji obuhvaća puno ovoga što o dobroj ekonomiji danas pričamo, dakle uključivanje građana u proces odlučivanja, zasnivanje razvoja na nekakvim postulatima koji nisu isključivo samo profitno usmjereni, nego imaju i nekakvu širu društvenu vrijednost, odnosno kod nas najvažnije je nekakvu okolišnu vrijednost. I rezultat tog procesa je bilo potpisivanje 2018. povelje o državnom razvoju otoka koje je gradsko vijeće grada Cresa usvojilo. Ali zapravo ja nisam vama došao pričati o tome, nego sam htio pričati o onome o čemu vjerojatno ako vam sad izguglate Cres i nekakve vijesti će vam prvo izaći kao rezultat na tražilici, a to je naša energetska tranzicija. Dakle, mi smo se uključili... 2018. godine u priču oko inicijative za čistu energiju pri tajništvu, pri formiranom tajništvu za otoke pri Evropskoj komisiji i postali smo jedan od pilot projekta u fazi energetske tranzicije. Mi smo predali svoju inicijativu i i izradili strategiju koja je nama zapravo baza i temelj našeg budućeg razvoja. Isto tako kao što znate, na našem području se gradi najveća solarna elektrana u Republici Hrvatskoj, gdje je u suradnju Primorsko-Goranske županije grada Cresa i investitora HEPA gradi se elektrana 6,5 MW i ona će za sad biti najveća u Hrvatskoj. Ali ta elektrana s jedne strane zapravo podiže svijest o mogućnostima u laganju u energiju i u nešto što je, u čistu energiju što je do sada našim građanima bilo poprilično strano. S druge strane, ona nama ne pridonosi u onoj mjeri koje bi mi htjeli, jer kad je investitor HEP, dakle građani od toga nemaju puno u smislu izravne uključivosti. Dakle, možemo problematizirati da li ako poslije želimo ulogu HEP-a u u priči izgradnje elektrane i uključivanju zajednica, mislim da je tu još uvijek jedan kruti sistem i još uvijek oni nisu prepoznali to da zapravo u svim njihovim investicijama trebali biti jedinice lokalne samouprave na neki način uključenja direktno da imaju direktne benefite. Osim naravno ono što je po zakonu komunalne naknade i komunalnog doprinosa pri gradnji. Ali to je nas potaknulo za cijelu jednu novu priču oko energetske tranzicije gdje smo mi se obvezali, odnosno gdje smo mi prepoznali ono što što se tu može dovojiti, dakle, ako smo mi u situaciji da imamo taj broj sunčani sati koji imamo, da možemo zapravo pokrenuti priču gdje možemo uključiti sve zainteresirane dionike na području cresa i civilnog sektora, građanstva i naravno institucija javne vlasti kako bi bili partneri u tom cijelom procesu. I onda smo se odlučili za osnivanjem energetske zadruge. Evo, energetska zadraga bit će osnovana za deset dana, to će biti osnivačka skupština, u nju će biti uključeni grad Cres, privatne firme, privatne tvrke sa područja grada Cresa i Lošinja, grad Mali Lošinj i još nekoliko fizičkih osoba i aktera iz civilnog sektora, među kojima želim istaknuti pokret otoka koji nam je puno pomogao u samoj fazi realizacije te cijele priče. Zašto je to važno? To je važno zato što ta energetska zadruga već u startu ima jedan projekt koji je opipljiv. Dakle, na samom sjeveru otoka koji je nama posebno, je rekao bih, infrastrukturno nije na onoj razini koje bi mi htjeli, nalazi se lokacija na kojoj ćemo graditi buduću solarnu elektranu, a investitor u tu solarnu elektranu zapravo biti će energetska zadruga. Faza je tog projekta da se trenutno nalazimo na idejnom projektu, idemo sad na lokacijsku dozvolu i nakon toga na potvrdu glavnog projekta, odnosno na građevinski projekt i onda je ideja da nju isfinanciramo, to je mala solarna elektrana od 500 kW, od prilike vrijednosti do 3 miliona kuna, sad to su nekakve zadnje kalkulacije, moram priznati da nisam ekspert po pitanju ulaganja u tehnologiju, ali s obzirom da tehnologija za panele padat, mislim da je negdje oko 3 miliona ona zadnja kalkulacija i mi bi crowdfundingom isfinancirali 
isfinancirali tu elektranu, imamo dosta zainteresiranih ulagača sa područja Cresa i na taj način bi je zapravo omogućili ljudima da neki način zarađuju od onoga od one energije što se proizvede u toj solarnoj elektrani. Već imamo zainteresiranog velikog kupca, jednu turičku firmu i našu vodoopskorbu koje su zainteresirane za otkup takve vrste energije. I to je zapravo ona priča gdje se Ceres želi vijeti. Što se tiče energetske zadruge, energetska zadruga Dobra je stvar da ima jedan konkretan projekt na početku kako bi ljude motivirali kako to ne bi ostalo kao nekakva zadruga o kojoj niko ništa ne zna, a zadruga obično kod nekih ljudi izaziva s obzirom na ranije okolnosti nekakav negativan prizvuk. Konkretan projekt je dosta važan jer je to nekako prvi korak u realizaciji jednog od projekata nakon kojeg će se, mi smo uvjereni, razviti još mnogi projekti koji se tiču čiste energije, a koji će biti zasnovani na toj obliku suradnje i udruživanja. Kako ne bi ostalo samo na tome, jedan od planova je i u našim urbaničkim planovima isto tako primijeniti sve one postulate koje smo u našem programu energetske tranzicije zamislili, dakle i u zgradarstvu, da se zapravo cijeli jedan dio cresa formira, odnosno definira kao jedan zeleni kvart gdje će nekakvi energetski nadstandardi biti obvezni, a gdje će ljudi koji tamo žele graditi svoje nekakve kuće ili domove za stanovanje, gdje će biti na neki način stimulirani, jer u startu je naravno kad nekoga natjerate da radi nešto nadstandardno, toga nešto i više i košta, međutim ideja je da se komunalnim doprinosom ipak te ljude potakne da na taj način realiziramo ono što smo zamislili. Isto tako u našoj energetskoj tranziciji zamišljeno je, kao što znate, otoci su povezani trajektima, da se u nekoj skoroj budućnosti ti trajekti, kad kažem skoroj budućnosti, govorimo o razdoblju 5 do 10 godina, to je nekako, ajmo reći, srednjoročni plan, ali 5 godina brzo proleti, da se naši trajekti koji su najveći, jedno od najvećih izvora proizvodnje mogućnog dioksida, odnosno oni su svi dizelaši, kao što vjerojatno i znate, da se zamijene trajektima koje će biti upogonjeni na održive oblike energije, dakle da li je električni ili na vodik. S obzirom da su naše relacije na naša dva trajektna pristaništa poprilično blizu, mogli bi čak i električni trajekti prometovati na našim linijama. Jedan od isto tako projekata je izgradnja i solarka na našem vrtiću, gdje će također energetska zadruga biti nositelj projekata. A sad ja bih vam htio otprilike reći s kojim se izazovima Cres uočava s obzirom na to da smo jedan mediteranski primorski grad oslonjen na turizam i što nam zapravo predstavlja nekakvu nekakvu bojazan od, odnosno problem za buduće budući život i rad na Cresu, to vam je naravno, kao što znate, cijena nekretnina. Dakle, kod nas se sad događa jedan proces izgradnje koja je poprilično skupa, koja je naravno tržišno uvjetovana i sad je i samim time utječe na, s obzirom na turizam, utječe na cijenu cijenu najmova stanova i dostupnosti zapravo opće stambenog prostora. E sad, kako bi se i s time izborili, izradili smo registar nekretnina koji je zapravo jedna baza podataka svih nekretnina koje su u vlasništu što države, što opće narodne imovine od društvenog vlasništa, jer Ceres je jedno jako kompleksno mjesto što se tiče imovinsko-pravnih odnosa, mi imamo puno ovaj nerješenih imovinsko-pravnih odnosa s obzirom da su tamo još uvijek upisani optanska imovina, stranci, jer je Ceres, kao što znate, nekad bio i pod Italijom, pod Austro-Ugorskom, tako da imamo puno neuređene zemljišnje knjige. Nažalost, to je posao države, odnosno državne geodetske uprave i ministarstva pravosuđa, koji za sada nekakvim sporim tempom imaju namjeru to rješavati po Republici Hrvatskoj, a otoci su tu prvenstveno, prvenstveno na nekakvom na nekakvom udaru i onda nam to onemogućava nekakve procese 
koje bi nam, ko, za kojim smatramo da bi mogli revitalizirati cresti. Dakle, jedna od ideja je koja će se zasigurno u narednom razdoblju događati, da se registrom nekretnina jel, ustanove one, one zgrade koje stoje derutne, odnosno ili napuštene u centru grada, da se te grade, zgrade koje se mogu, naravno, upi, grad Cres upiš, upiše kao vlasnik, i onda iz onih suvlasničkih udjela kojih ima dosta u privatnim stanovima koji, se, koji će se suvlasnicima prodati, da se ovaj, poseban program, programski namijeni taj novac za obnovu tih starih tih kuća u centru grada, starih kuća koje će za, nakon što se obnove biti ponuđene mladim obiteljima uz prihvatljive cijene najmova kao nešto što bi riješilo njihovo, njihovo ovaj, stambeno pitanje dugoročno, a i na neki način smanjilo cijenu najma koja je dosta visoka, koje tržište sad diktira, koje je uvjetovano, uvjetovano, uvjetovano turizmu. E sad, kad bih isto se osvrnuo na koronu, e, rekao bih da smo sad na prvu prošli bolje nego Gent nakon, ovaj, nakon ove prve, prve faze, ne znam što će biti ove sezone, dosta, je, dosta je neizvjesnosti, s obzirom da dosta toga ovisi o političkim odlukama, dakle, da li će se neke zone proglašavati, da li će biti potrebno testiranje, da li će biti ovako, onako, to je dosta jedna izvjesnost kod svih naših, ovaj, kod, 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 kod svih dionika koji su zapravo povezani na turizam, pa od poljoprivredne zadruge do, do malih proizvođača e, poljoprivrednih proizvoda, da ne kažemo o hotelima i, i, i iznajemljivanjima u domaćinstvu. E, tako da ja vjerujem da će ova sezona zapravo biti pokazatelj na koji način je COVID zaista utjecao na, na turizam i kako, kako taj turizam učiniti, učiniti održivim. Kaže, naša je sreća što je, smo mi prostorno, ono što nam je nešto, nesreća trebamo pretvoriti u nekakvu, u nekakvu prednost što smo rasprostranjen otok sa, sa puno površine i sa dosta tih sela koje isto tako imaju napuštene pasterske stanove, pa vjerujemo da, će, da, da imamo plan da bi te stanove i te objekte pretvorili u nekakve objekte održivog od, od, održivog turizma u smislu otvaranja to mogućnostima mladima koji žele koji žele sa nekakvim obiteljskim poljoprivrednim gospodarstvima ovaj, formirati nekakvu novu ponudu koja je kod nas još uvijek uspoređujući nas sa Istrom na rudimentarnoj rezini evo jedna kuća se obnovila na sjeveru predivno izgleda u selu Rosuja koje je bilo napušteno međutim iziskivala je puno E, puno financijskih izdataka od strane, od strane privatnih ulagača, tako da dvije fizičke osobe tamo žive i znamlju i to, 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 to će biti jedna lijepa priča. E, ja bih vam e, s vama i podijelio još jednu muku zapravo s kojom se suočavaju e, otoci, a to vam je pitanje gospodaranja otpadom. Naime, grad Cres je, s obzirom na ove uredbe gospodaranje otpadom, sve što znate u Primorskoj Goranskoj županiji, centar za gospodaranje otpadom Marišina i sve, sve ono što, su, što, je, što, je, što je naša vlada preuzela obaveze, mi smo to sve učinili, dakle mi smo sanirali naše odlagalište, mi smo izgradili reciklažno dvorište i mi ne odlažemo ni, ni kilogram otpada više na otoku. Međutim, što se događa? Taj razvrstani otpad koji... koji koji, koje naše komunalne usluge razvrstava i to je, komunalne usluge su zajednička firma Cresa, grada Cresa, grada Lošinja, e, razvrstanu plastiku, papir, metal, ne možemo postići zapravo ništa drugo, osim da mi zapravo, onima kojima, kojima to plasiramo zapravo moramo platiti da bi uzeli. E, naravno da je situacija povezana negdje, to traje već dvije, pol, tri godine kad je Kina prestala otkupljivati svu plastiku, tako da je to nekakav globalni problem. E sad, i za to postoji nekakvo rješenje, dakle smanjenje uporavne te jednokratne plastike, mi smo u nekakvoj sradnji sa, sa udrugom Terra Hub imali više radionica vezano, vezano za smanjenje uporabe jednokratne plastike, smislili smo jedan i projektić koje, koje je nositelj turistička zajednica kako bi svih naših ugostiteljskih objekata izbacili jednokratnu plastiku i time barem malo pridonijeli, pridonijeli smanjenju ne samo okolišnog zagađenja što, što jednokratna plastika često radi jer znate da se zna naći onda poslije i na plažama i u, i u šumama nego da bi smanjili zapravo, zapravo i pritisak na, na, na naše komunalne usluge. Kažem, to je jedan problem s kojim se jedinice lokalne samoprave neće moći same nositi, evo ja im tu bojazan, s obzirom na one cijene, na tarife koje su propisane u centrima za gospodarenjem otpadom, neki od vas ovdje možda isto tako su u, 
u, u, tim, u, sličnim, u sličnim problemima, a otoci su, kažem, dosta fragilne ovaj, sistemi po tom pitanju, jer sve što dođe na otok, neki način mora s otoka otići, što se, a, 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 prijevoz, a prijevoz, je, prijevoz je skup. Evo, ja bi evo, s ovime bi završio i otvorio bi raspravu po pitanju bilo čega i nadam se da imate nekakva pitanja i stojim na raspolaganju. Hvala. Uh, ajmo prvo prije rasprave čuti priču iz Kupronice, pa onda imati zajedničku raspravu prije pauze, uh, da, 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 on, da, bude sve, da bude sve zajedno. Do gradonačelnica grada, Ksenija Ostriž, isto jedna priča s kontinenta. Dobar dan svima. Možda nam čak i ne treba ovo. Treba? Mikrofon? Ok. Aha, zbog zvuka. Evo, lijepi pozdrav iz Koprivnice, a zapravo smo u Zagrebu. Danas sam vam došla ispričati priču o Koprivnici koja je počela sa svojim projektima održivog razvoja, odnosno razvoja grada na konceptu održivosti početkom 2000-ih godina. Naime, zapravo sve je počelo sa nekoliko ekoloških entuzijasta, tako ću ja to nazvati, u gradu, koji svaki mali grad, mi u Koprivnici se svi međusobno poznajemo i zapravo na toj nekakvoj prijateljskoj osnovi smo krenuli raditi lokalnu agendu 21. Ako se sjećate, to je, odnosno, to je bila nekakva prva inicijativa rađenja strateških dokumenta za razvoj gradova. 2008. smo napravili prvi biološki pročistač u Hrvatskoj koji je danas vjerojatno po tehnologiji najsuvremeniji i to nam je omogućilo da zaštitimo i lokalne vodotoke, s obzirom na to da je Koprivnica mali, ali grad sa velikom industrijom. Imamo veliku prehrambenu industriju, kod nas rade Carlsberg, danske tvrtke poput Hartmana koje proizvode papirnu industriju, još nekoliko poduzetnika, belupo, farmaceutska industrija itd. I zapravo je trebalo zaštititi okoliš. 2011. smo otvorili prvu kompostanu. Kompostanu smo otvorili zato da bismo razvrstavajući otpad i smanjili odlaganje miješanog komunalnog otpada i kako bismo proizvodili lokalno kompost. I to je bilo bazirano i dan danas je tako da svi građani koji predaju zeleni otpad dobiju za uzrat kompost. Dakle, na taj način obogačuju i svoje povrtnjake i okoliš i tak dalje. Te iste godine smo krenuli u... Zapravo isplanirali smo zeleni kvart u Koprivnici u kojem smo rekli, ok, tamo ćemo graditi samo pasivne kuće, napravit ćemo u suradnji sa arhitektonskim fakultetom i građevinskim fakultetom iz Zagreba, nešto što će možda poslužiti kao inspiracija ostalima. Tako smo osnovali agenciju za poticanu stanogradnju i po tom principu smo napravili 75 post stanova u tri stambene, više stambene zgrade koje smo mi nazvali šparne hiže. Znači, te šparne hiže su zapravo tada prije deseta godina imale sve od izalica topline, solarnih elektrana i tak dalje i u tom kvartu smo rekli sve parcele koje imamo, a koprimičanci vam jako vole živjeti u obiteljskim kućama, vole imati svoje okućnice i grad se zapravo i širi na taj način da nastaju mala naselja obiteljskih kuća. Rekli smo, ok, niko neće morat plaćati komunalni doprinos za svoju novu izgrađenu kuću ako ona bude po principima pasivne gradnje. I isto tako smo, paralelno razvojem kako smo preuzeli veliku bivšu vojarnu, koja više nije imala ulogu u nekakvom obrambenom sustavu Republike Hrvatske, počeli smo ju razvijati kao sve učilišni i centar i centar za društvenu ekonomiju, ajmo to tako nazvat recimo. 
Tu smo isto rekli to će biti zeleni kvart i unutra mogu ići samo električni automobili ili bicikli. Budući da je područje ogromno, preko 25 hektara, jer je jako puno bilo, preko 2500 vojnika je bilo aktivno tamo, onda znate da tamo su i proizvodili svoju hranu i to, mi smo odlučili to isto tako revitalizirati. Najzanimljivija, vjerojatno, kaj se tiče same samogradnje, je ta eko-sendvič kuća koja je napravljena bila 2015-2016 sa novim panelima i kad si uguglate Eko Sandvič kuća, onda vam ta prva crvena kuća iskoči koja je napravljena u Koprivnici. Isto onak dosta interesantno i inspirativno. Kaj smo radili dalje? Dalje smo radili jedan projekt i to nam je zbiljam jako puno pomoglo. Inače smo jako puno učili od partnera iz Evropske unije jer smo jako rano krenuli u u provođenje i pisanje i provođenje projekata iz predpristupnih fondova, onda sad i naravno naših nacionalnih. Mi smo zapravo, ja sam 2004.5. smo mi otvorili prvi poduzetnički inkubator, pa vam ovako iz prve ruke mogu pričati o tome, jer sam bila prva direktorica toga. I onda smo krenuli sa gradovima na sjeveru, poput Varaždina, Čakovca, Virovitice, Bjelovara i nas Koprivnice. Smo oformili regionalnu razvojnu agenciju Sjever i oformili smo godinu dana nakon toga regionalnu energetsku agenciju, koja je zapravo nama svih ovih godina suport. Ona zapošljava danas 13 inženjera, elektrotehnike, strojarstva i tak dalje, koji nam zapravo pomažu od objedinjene javne nabave energenata za ovo područje sjevera do zapravo uvijek su nam partner u našim projektima koji se tiču zelenog održivog energetike i sl. Tako da smo imali tu nekakvu, ajmo reći, domaću pamet koju smo koristili. Međutim, 2013. nam je prošao jedan jako zanimljiv projekt koji se zove Sivitas Dinamo, koji je potpuno promijenio koncept održive mobilnosti, odnosno prometa u gradu Koprivnici. Tada smo mi krenuli raditi prvi plan održive mobilnosti, ali zapravo je sam projekt rezultirao time da smo napravili dva mala električna autobusa koja besplatno dan danas voze po Koprivnici, znači imamo besplatni javni prijevoz električnim autobusima. Oni su vam jako grdi, to vam moramo odmah reći, nisu baš dizajnerski najuspjeliji, ali funkcioniraju i izvršavaju svoju osnovnu funkciju. Budući da je Koprivnica prostorno jako razvučen grad, onda vam je to zgodno kad dolaze djeca, klinci, studenti na sve učilište Sjever, koje je u tom smješteno u kampusu, znači u bivšoj vojarni. To je nekoliko kilometara od željezničke stanice i autobusne i onda taj bus koji ima redovne linije i onda ih vozi do recimo tog kampusa, ali i za penziće koji trebaju recimo od jednog dijela grada do drugog, je to jako zanimljivo. Inače, Koprivnica je grad biciklista i biciklizma i koji svi podravci, odnosno svi gradovi koji su na relativno ravnom terenu, puno ljudi vole voziti i od uvijek svi vozimo bicikliće. I tako smo mi napravili isto tako kroz projekte preko granične suradnje prve, terminale sa javnim biciklima. Danas ih ima osam terminala, oko sedamdesetak bicikala običnih i 11 električnih je postavljeno na tih sedam terminala po gradu. Imamo osam besplatnih javnih punionica električnih automobila. Kroz onaj projekt Sivita Zinom o kojem sam počela pričati, znači osim ta dva električna autobusa, mi smo nabavili i cijelu flotu električnih i hibridnih auta za sve u sustavu grada. Dakle, gradska uprava plus naša poduzeća, komunalna i sva ostala koja imamo i mi vam funkcioniramo tako da zapravo imamo te aute kao u sustavu grada i onda kome treba taj si uzme. Znači, niko nema svoj auto, nema ni gradonačelnik svoj osobni auto, nemamo mi ni vozača. Ja sam se isto dopelala sa cijednim hibridom i to tako zapravo funkcionira već sad Petu, pa šestu godinu, šestu godinu za redom. 
Taj projekt je još bio jako poseban po tome što nam je omogućio da izradimo kurikulum za dodiplomski studij održive mobilnosti i logistike na sveučilištu Sjever, tako da imamo i prve diplomante iz tog područja. I ove godine od jeseni, budući da je to malo sveučilište, do nedavno smo bili najmlađe javno sveučilište u Republici Hrvatskoj, nastalo kao spoj dva vele učilišta, Koprivničkog i Varaždinskog. I imamo preko 25 studijskih programa, a kad ste mali i mladi, onda morate imati kvalitetne programe da bi privukli studente. I zbog toga smo nekako se orijentirali da idemo u smjeru medijskog dizajna multimedije u smislu umjetničkih područja, novinarstva, turizma i poduzetništva, ali na malo jedan drugi način. I ono na što smo ponosni su ti studijski programi iz područja zelenog tak ću reći. Znači, održive mobilnosti i logistike, prehrambene tehnologije koja zapravo se jako kreće prema bio održivim načinima uzgoja hrane, ajmo to tako reći. Imamo čak i jednog mladog znanstvenika iz okolice Koprivnice koji je prošle godine bio proglašen za najboljeg mladog znanstvenika u Republici Hrvatskoj. Mislim da imamo čak desetaka i jedan radova objavljenih, koji radi neka isto luda istraživanja kako zapravo bojama u skladištima zadržati kvalitetu voća i povrća, bez da se tretira bilo čime, budući da smo mi kraj poznat po proizvodnji hrane, nama je to jako važna stvar. I mi zapravo želimo sad sljedeću stvar koju namjeravamo napraviti je da zelenu tržnicu koja je onak jako važna kod nas i puno ljudi kupuje na njoj i prodaje od lokalnih OPG-ova, koje smo isto počeli prije nekakvih 6-7 godina certificirati kroz certifikat Eko uzgajivača, da im zapravo podignemo standard držanja voća i povrća, da ne moraju svaki dan dostavljati to voće i povrće na tržnicu, nego da ga mogu pohraniti u u hladnjačama koje nisu tipične hladnjače. Znači, mi ne želimo preoblikovati tu tržnicu na način da ona bude potršač energije ili da ispušta nešto što nam, energetski otisak koji nam ne odgovara, nego hoćemo to na najprirodniji mogući način skladištiti. I s tim u vezi su se i povezali na sveučilištu sa centrom Rudolfa Štajnera iz Međimurja, koji isto tako imaju zanimljiv pristup proizvodnjih hrane kroz te biodinamičke principe. Pa nam je to jako zanimljivo i evo, imamo i ta pokusna polja koja nadam se da će u sljedećim godinama nuditi puno toga zanimljivog za vidjeti i gledati. I kaj sam još zaboravila? Aha, da, prošle godine smo počeli zatvarati kompostanu, znači nakon gotovo deset godina rada. Kompostanu smo kroz isto tako projekt koji je financiran iz Evropske unije u suradnji sa tehniksom iz preloga. Oni imaju puno patenata na temu oporabe i reciklaže. Tako da su oni nama ponudili jednu novu tehnologiju za koju se nadamo da će biti puno prihvatljivija i za okoliš i za ljude koji žive okolom, oko same kompostane, znači nema više mirisa, ona se zatvara, imamo i laboratorije tamo koji će strogo pratiti kakvoću toga, i zraka, i samog komposta i tako dalje. I proizvodi se jedna, ubrzava se sam proces, ali isključivo prirodnim putem. Tako da to nam je jako zanimljivo. I ono što planiramo u idućem razdoblju je napraviti centar za oporabu. To još nemamo, to nam fali. Centar za oporabu u kojem ćemo imati i majstore i u kojem ćemo zapravo raditi taj upcycling, ćemo reći, otpadnih materijala. Naime, blizu kompostane smo napravili novo reciklažno dvorište koje prima 48 čak ključnih brojeva i jako je uredno i tamo zapravo vam dođu svi od mojih lokalnih umjetnika koji hoće raditi neke skulpture i to onda im gospođa koja s tim upravlja uvijek ih nazove ili možeš doći. Danas su nam došla drvena vrata recimo pa do nekih ovoga sasvim stvari drugih. 
I možda još, aha da, zadnja stvar koja je zapravo najmanja u ovoj cijeloj priči o nekakvim malim projektima grada Koprivnice vezanim uz održivi razvoj i dobru ekonomiju je priča o smuteku koja je meni osobno najdraža. Mi smo to nazvali, to je mali jedan take out na našem placu. Jer smo, došli smo prošle godine na ideju da to otvorimo, zato jer je i uslijed COVID-a i inače onak... Koliko god da vi ljude obrazujete, uvijek oni kad dođu na klupe i pogledaju te proizvode, pa ako baš nisu jabuke zgledne, kako mi to velimo u podrovini, onda će odabrati neke koje malo bolje izgledaju. I onda nekakvi ostaci voća, povrća i tak dalje, koji možda neće dobiti prolaznu ocjenu kod tipičnog kupca na tržnici. Mi smo to odlučili otkupljivati od naših OPG-ova i miksati u smutije. I te smutije smo počeli prvo prodavati, uredili smo taj jedan mali lokal tamo koji je bio, onak, jedan stari obrtnik je izašao, više otišao u penziju. I onda smo počeli širiti ponudu, osim smutija na početku smo počeli onda proizvoditi i malo neke vrste hrane, sendvića, ali sve zapravo lokalno i tipično s domaćim ovim um, namirnicama. Evo, mislim da sam zapravo spomenula ovako od ovih stvari sve kaj sam mislila vezano uz ove projekte. Pa ako bude još vas nešto zanimalo, tu sam. Dobro, super, hvala. Evo, otvaramo diskusiju, pitanja, komentare. Imamo dvije lijepe priče, dva zanimljiva primjera. Svaki poseba na svoj način, sa nekim zajedničkim izazovima, ali čuli smo jako puno i o hrani, i o energetskoj unčikovitosti, i o obnovljivim izvorima energije, i o gospodarenju otpadom, uključivanju građana. Pa evo, ako imate pitanja za predstavnike ova dva grada, slobodno. Mora li nas ljudi slušati? Bog svima, obzirom da sam sused od Ksenije, onda mi je ovo super priča, pa ću poštedit odgovor ovaj put, ali Marina mora malo peglat, ipak je potegnula do Zagreba. Na koji način građani reagiraju prema ovom nekakvom elementu sudlovanja o procesima donošenja odluka? Znamo da je to dosta seksi tema, ali isto vremeno znamo i da se rijetko uključuju, pa vi ste očito napravili jednu dobru priču na Cresu, gdje je to možda otišlo na jedan zavidni korak. Svi se trudimo zapravo na neki način uključivati i s jedne strane oni to ne žele, ili možda žele na jedan drugi način ili drugačiji način. Kako ste vi uspjeli zapravo nekak doći do tog krajnje građana koji se onda uključuje u ovaj element dobre ekonomije, koja nije nužno samo, jel, to je dobro rečeno na početku, samo dio ekonomije, nego zapravo te nekakve aktivne građanske participacije? Evo, Hrvoj, hvala ti na pitanju. Nije bilo naručeno. Pa, mislim da je, što se tiče uključivanja građana u svim zajednicima koje tome teže, da je uvijek situacija više manje slična, uključuju se u sve te stvari isti ljudi. Naravno, kad su te radionice, uvijek isti ljudi dolaze na radionice i ti isti ljudi su proaktivni. Dakle, uvijek je, rekao bih, još uvijek se čini da je manjina ljudi, pojedinaca koje žele biti aktivno uključeni, a onda nekako to vam je u sredstvu tako kad jedan nešto napravi, onda bi svi drugi vidjeti taj primjer, pa se onda i oni žele uključiti. Tako da to je nekakva moja misao i nešto što mi se čini kao rasplak događa koji će se dogoditi u sredstvu kad krene samo energetska zadruga, kad bude izrađena elektrana, odnosno kad se budu trebali ljudi uključivati, na taj način ja vjerujem da će to funkcionirati. Dakle, uvijek je nekakva manjina koja je proaktivna, koja sudjeluje, koja jednostavno tu sebe iznalazi, a onda nakon toga kad ljudi vide da je nešto dobro, onda se i oni kao po nekoj inerciji uključuje, zašto bi samo ovi koji su tu bili imali nekakvu svoju prednost. Ipak rekla nek. Osnovna poruka je da svaki čovjek je jako važan. Everybody counts. Svaki građan koji dođe s nekom zelenom idejom treba biti podržan. Ako je ona i ole relevantna i moguća za izvesti. To je ono što je osnovno. Nikad ne treba nikog odbaciti. Prije isto nekoliko godina je došla ekipa od dvoje, troje mladih ljudi isto kod nas i rekli su, mi znamo, gledali smo malo tamo uz potok 
je neka gradska zemlja, tam se ništa ne događa, mi bi htjeli napraviti gradske vrtove. I onak, ali samo da se sadi po eko principu, ništa veliko. I stvarno napravljeno je preko 50 malih gradskih vrtova koji funkcioniraju. Mi smo sad otvorili na dru, potpuno drugom dijelu grada novu isto E, e, novo područje na kojima idu novi gradski ekovrtovi, znači ljudi koji žive u stanovima se tam nešto sade. E, toga svega ne bi bilo da nemamo taj civilni sektor kojeg jako podupiremo koliko god da nas nekad i kritiziraju i nisu zadovoljni i dođu uvijek i vele ne znam ovo vam je glupo, ovo tak ne treba, ne biraju niti riječi nekad u, u komentarima, oni su zapravo jako važni. Jako važni, zato jer su to građani koji žive taj grad, koji imaju neke ideje i njih se treba slušati. Evo, to sam samo htjela dodati. Dobro. E, imamo li još koje pitanje? Neko drugo za Koprivnicu ili za Cres? Hvala, ma ja zapravo imam dva pitanja za oboje sugovornika, odnosno govornika naših. Za, za Marina, dakle, pitanje energetske zadruge. Kako je uopće došlo do toga? Ko, ko je tu dao nekakvu podršku? I jel mi tu govorimo o prvoj takvoj energetskoj zadruzi u Hrvatskoj ili, ili vas je netko pretekao? A, a za Kseniju bi molio um, odgovor... Dosta ste puta rekli da imate projekte gdje surađujete sa znanstvenim sektorom, sa istraživačima i slično. To zapravo ovako, koliko se meni čini, koliko pratim sa strane iz udrugih gradova, nije toliko zapravo običajna stvar. Dakle, nama tu generalno postoji potreba da se pojača taj, ta suradnja sa, sa znanstvenim sektorom. Kako je to išlo kod vas? Imate li kakav savjet za, za druge gradove? Evo, hvala. Um, opet je kod nas u Koprivnici specifična situacija zato kad smo mi mali i svi se znamo. I onda uh, recimo vam se dogodi da čovjek koji je ne znam, doktor znanosti iz uh, četiri područja je Koprivničanac koji uh, želi uh, razvijati sve učilište u svojem gradu, vrati se iz Zagreba u Koprivnicu i okuplja ljude koji imaju progresivne ideje. Znači, postavlja za voditelje ne znam, programa, studijskih programa, one koji su otvoreni za komunikaciju, za suradnju i tako dalje. Ima jedna stvar sa znanstvenom zajednicom, a to je da su oni toliko često jako involvirani u te stvari koje rade, da oni rijetko kad se promoviraju, oni ne koriste puno društvene mreže, Uh, oni nisu influenceri znanstvenici, a i sad smo vidjeli u ovoj pandemiji COVID-a uh, oni znanstvenici koji se i odvaže govoriti o temama koje su sad važne, uh, budu često napadnuti, jer se javnosti nekako možda ne sviđa to kaj govore. Tako da ja mislim da mi trebamo jako razvijati tu kulturu poštivanja uh, pameti, znanja, uh, ulaganja u znanost, E, nisam to sad spomenula vezano uz ove projekte koje radimo, ali mi isto silno se trudimo e, ulagati ono od, od prečkole kroz različite netipične programe, e, kroz centre izvrsnosti u osnovnim školama, kroz robotiku, znači nekakav kult znanja i kult obrazovanja hoćemo e, 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 držati u Koprivnici, ne želimo da, da, da nam djeca rastu da nekako shvaćaju sve površno. I to nam je jako važno. I ja mislim da, ne, da u tom smjeru um, je moguće ostvariti suradnju. I uvijek treba promovirati dobre, primjere dobre prakse. To je ono što je kod nas podravaca uvijek problem. Naši ljudi ne vole govoriti o sebi, ne vole se isticati, nas zapravo nema ni na nacionalnoj politici kad gledate ono, koga znate ovako od podravaca. Kad bi vas pitala, nemate, ono, zapravo ne znate nikog, je li tak? Tako da, to mi se čini da je jako važno. Mi nekako nastojimo lokalno slaviti svaku suradnju. Znanosti, fakulteta i, i poduzetnika ili 
gradske uprave. Eto. Mislim da svi znamo Zvonka Mršića. Da, evo Marko, samo da se ja da pravom odgovoriti na to pitanje. Dakle, što se tiče naše energetske zadruge, bio je jedan posjet tog novog formiranog tajništva za otoke. Inicijativu je imao Tonino Picula za formiranje tog tajništva i na neki način mi smo tu to prepoznali. Isto tako vlasnici zemljišta na kojima će se to realizirati su isto tako ljudi koji su bili sami zainteresirani to odraditi i oni su se nekako obratili gradu, a u igrom slučaju mi imamo i otočnu razvojnu agenciju, osnivači su gradovi Ceres i Lošinj, koji su pružili veliki suport u toj cijeloj priči i nekako smo na njih uspjeli prebaciti taj operativni dio posla, jer se često u gradskoj upravi od silnih administrativnih stvari zagubi taj dio projektnog razmišljanja i realizacije. Tako da smo zaposlili sada osobu kao voditelja energetske tranzicije baš pri otočnoj razvojne agenciji. To je nekakav smjer kojim želimo ići da to bude uvijek nekako ispred same okoštale strukture javne uprave, da to ipak bude jedna razina više i što se tiče i energije i kreativnosti i domišljatosti. A grad tu uvijek mora naravno služiti kao potpora i onaj koji potiče sve te procese koji se događaju. Da li smo prvi, čini mi se da ćemo u ovom bliku biti prvi, ali nešto slično se događa na Krku, Evo, ne znam što bi sad Vjeran Piršić rekao kad kažem da ćemo biti prvi, ali čini mi se da ćemo, što se tiče ovakvog oblika energetska zadruga, ovakvog formiranja i ovakve realizacije projekta biti prvi. Hvala. Imamo jedno pitanje i od ljudi koji nas gledaju na live streamu. Kako predstavljate svoje gradove, kako se razvijaju, to zvuči dosta zanimljivo i privlačno i sad za očekivati je da ćete privući i veći interes mladih kreativaca, IT zaposlenika, znači osoba iz te branše, što također može povećati cijenu nekretnina, što smo već čuli da je situacija na cresu zbog turizma. Da li vidite, pitanje, da li vidite tu neku opasnost od gentrifikacije ili kako to... Kako vidite možda dolazak novih, mladih ljudi, kreativnih ljudi kao rizik da se zapravo još više povećaju cijene nekretnina? Da li vidite tu povezanost? Evo, tako je pitanje. Mi se borimo sa gradskim zemljištem protiv te opasnosti. Znači, uveli smo prije prošle godine, nakon što nam se nekako činilo da ovi postmodeli, da smo to već sad isprobali, I odlučili smo ne graditi velike zgrade sa puno stanova, po 15 stanova recimo ili 20, 25 čak mislim da su ove tri bile. Krenuli smo raditi male urbane vile sa po tri stana koje imaju puno nižu cijenu onda kvadrata. Međutim, dvije zone recimo koje nam nisu bile toliko atraktivne, a htjeli smo pokrenuti život u tome svemu i opet dati mladim ljudima Priliku otvorili smo program koji snižava cijenu parcele do 80% čak ako se radi o deficitarnim zanimanjima. Znači, ako ste mlađi od 45 godina, cijena zemljišta za 50% pada. Nakon toga za djecu pa za deficitarno zanimanje koje nama treba u tom momentu u gradu Koprivnici, znači profesori, medicinski, stručnjaci, sestre, lječnici, ne znam, farmaceuti zbog farmaceutske industrije i tako dalje, oni svi mogu dobiti isto tako onda olakšice. I to je onako otišlo prošle godine prvih šest parcela, sad se već kuće grade. Onda smo ove godine otvorili ponovno, to je na pet parcele došlo 30 zamolbi, što je nama jako bilo zgodno i sad već deset sljedećih pripremamo. 
I nekako mijenjamo sad i taj generalni urbanistički plan i ja se nadam da će me moj čuti jer uvijek oni vele, oj ti te tvoje ide. Sad si opet došla s nečim. Kaj sad hoćeš, kuću za leptire ili nešto? Da. Nastojimo zapravo razvijati ga tako da sadimo i radimo nove parkove. To je ono nekako, Koprinica je poznata po tome kad kod nas dođete na glavni gradski trg, onda je veliki park i jedan smo od rijetkih gradova koji ima tako otvoreni središnji trg prema gradskom parku, ali to bismo nekako željeli zadržati i formirati isto takve zone za ugodan život. I nadamo se da će sa poboljšanjem provetne povezanosti doista se još više mladih ljudi doseljavati. Jer to je veliki problem. Ja vjerujem svagdje i na otocima i kod nas u sela se prazne. Koprivnica je ostala dobra s brojem stanovnika zato što se sela prazne. To je problem. Pa ja bih rekao da mi pozdravljamo dolazak novih mladih ljudi, tako da to nama u tom smislu neće biti problem nekakav ono poseban per se. Znači, kod nas je generalan problem cijene nekretnine i dostupnosti kao što je u većini obalnih mjesta s obzirom na turizam i sezonalnost i iznimljivanje. Kažem, evo, rekao sam jedan od modela na koji ćemo se fokusirati, ali isto tako urbaničkim planom ćemo isplanirati kategorije i zone u kojima se to na neki način može po nekakvim pristupačnim uvjetima koje su, koliko može biti pristupačno nešto na otoku, jer kažem, cijena izgradnja na otoku je uvijek nekako skuplja. Ne znam kako bi vam to dočarao, ali evo, dođite pa vidite. Sve što se na otoku događa ima nekakvu svoju cijenu, ali otok ima i svoj draž, imate predivnu obalu, imate puno šuma, puno šetnica, puno staza u kojem se svi ljudi koji žele mogu na neki način izgubiti, tako da nema bojaznosti da će na cresu kvaliteta života pasti u smislu samog cresa, ne ponude. Bojazan je da mi tu uspijemo na taj način privući ljude koji jednostavno ne mogu si priuštiti ove komercijalne cijene koje su na tržištu. I s tim se mi moramo boriti kroz nekakve programe koje sam sad istaknuo i kroz urbanističke planove. Dobro, hvala. Imamo li još neko pitanje? Tu iz publike... Ako nemamo, hvala puno. Bilo je jako lijepo čut naše primjere dobre prakse i želimo samo da nastavite tako i dalje. Sad ćemo imati jednu pauzu od pol sata. Pauza je tu odmah, idete, ako sam dobro shvatio, desno od Varane, pa onda nastavljamo točno u podne sa opet jednim uključivanjem izvana, gdje ćemo zapravo poznati kako funkcioniraju mreže koje okupljaju gradove i regije koje podržavaju društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju. Evo, hvala.
Okay, we will continue with the conference. Uh, right now we have a session with, uh, uh, with presentations and debate how uh, networks for uh, social and solidarity economy can help uh, cities and regions to, to create, to support, to provide public policies uh, for this sector. So first, uh, with us, uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Lauren Quark, who is, a, uh, who is a, a General Secretary of uh, Global Social Economy Forum, which is a global uh, network of uh, public authorities and other stakeholders that are supporting uh, social and solidarity economy. So she will uh, give us a global overview uh, what is current situation with this um, uh, with this uh, field of uh, SSC. So Lawrence, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I know that you also uh, have a busy day and uh, uh, your own uh, activities within GSF. Thank you for joining us, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Drazen. Um, good morning to everybody. Dobro jutro, eminent mayors, deputy officials, directors of different departments of the Christian cities and municipalities, distinguished guest experts and speakers, practitioners and activists of social solidarity economic organizations and enterprise and general public. Even though I'm virtually connected with you from Seoul due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm so happy and very honored to be with you all and to speak to this important conference, the Seven Good Economy Conference, which is co-organized with the Croatian Association of Cities, focusing on the public policies of the social solidarity economy. As the aim of this conference is to share good examples from all over Croatia and countries from other regions to promote models and real stories that are economically valuable and to secure fair and participatory relations by providing practical and real solutions for democratic management of social solidarity economic organizations and enterprise as well as commons. I hope that the experience of the global social economy forum that I'm going to share with you would be an interesting story for you all to understand how we are promoting public policies of social solidarity economy co-created uh, in many cities or through a close partnership between local government and social solidarity economic uh, stakeholders and networks in different countries. Let me first introduce our network of, of GSEF. The Global Social Economy um, Forum is an international network of local government and social solidarity economic organizations and networks are working together to promote and develop social solidarity economic ecosystem uh, as a, a strategic tool for the local economic development. It is established in November 2014 in Seoul, capital city of uh, Republic of Korea, after the second international conference, uh, which was hosted by the city of uh, Seoul. It was uh, established to strengthen public-private partnership uh, between local government and social solidarity economic uh, organizations and networks for the uh, development of their own territories as a base for the uh, promotion of social solidarity economy. Currently, we have 78 members on the five continents coming from 37 countries, including 27 local governments and the network of local governments, which are affiliated to GSEP and 35 social solidarity economic, national, regional, and intercontinental networks, including the RITES. What we are trying to do is uh, basically through uh, exchange of our experience, we are promoting the social solidarity economy, especially as a strategy for the equitable, inclusive, and sustainable development tools, and particularly for local economic development of cities and regions, and also by, by doing this uh, to localize and contribute for the achievement of sustainable development goals. 
So in order to meet this objective, we are accompanying local governments across the world in the collaboration process with social solidarity economy stakeholders towards the co-creation of public policies and the establishment of sustainable ecosystem conducive to the development of social solidarity economy. So before I move to, pre to present uh, the work of GSEF, let me very briefly uh, mention about the current context of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, because why I would like to mention about this context, because in current context of COVID-19 pandemic crisis, social solidarity economy is emerging as a very important strategy and policy to actually address uh, its consequences and to rebuild um, its social economic consequences. As we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has been a catalyst for revealing pre-existing shortfalls and systemic deficiencies of our economic system, but also our societies. Actually that all of the societies, uh, whether uh, they are developed or, or they are developing, they are going through a spiral of uh, crisis and precariousness and particularly in the health care sectors, uh, especially in terms of access to the good quality of health care and also a social economic level. And especially in some of developing countries, uh, food, this, this crisis are coupled with food shortages aggravated by the ecological crisis and which are even worsened by the rising poverty and inequalities uh, which are aggravated by the loss of jobs for 100 million of workers. So this spiral of uh, crisis and, and, and precariousness are uh, having a very uh, important short and long-term impact on the development issues as well as for the communities. As, um, at the same time that all of countries are affected, but we are not affected uh, by this crisis at the same scope and same speed. There are populations and communities who are much more affected than others, and especially those who uh, are considered as informal workers, migrant workers, women, refugees, vulnerable elderly people, youth, and particularly in developing countries. According to the World Bank, World Bank estimates actually between 300 million to 400 million people will fall into a situation of poverty since last uh, year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are uh, specialists from UN University and International uh, uh, Institute for Development Economic Research are even estimating at 400 million to 580 million people will fall into the situation of poverty. This means that the responsibility to act against increasing poverty and equality has been a very important issue for the government as well as for the international society, international, uh, society and communities, uh, especially, I think, including for uh, local government and cities. And I would like to uh, uh, mention that uh, Within this current context of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as I already said, social solidarity economy is emerging and, and, and is prioritized by many police makers and governments as the alternative policies to address social economic consequences, especially in terms of boosting creation and conservation of decent jobs uh, in the societies but particularly for the vulnerable populations who are mostly affected uh, by the crisis. But it was already uh, mentioned by various international organizations such as ILO and URICSE in their joint study on the future of work um, before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis that SSC organizations can help channel jobs in emerging sectors like the silver economy uh, that are at risk of non-standard form of works within uh, entrepreneurial organizations that can provide more structure and security. And this is uh, you know, totally revealed during the COVID-19 crisis 
So actually both governments and uh, national and local governments in developed countries, as well as in developing countries are giving a very high attention to the social solidarity economy as a possible strategy and, and also alternative development strategy to address those consequences of um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So certainly uh, social solidarity economy has a key role and potential to play in mid to long-term job recovery strategies uh, uh, in various uh, economic sectors, such as the care industries, organic health food production distribution, circular economy, sanitation, healthcare, etc. So within this um, current context of our time that I would like to share with you how GCEP support the development of social solidarity economy, especially promoting conducive public policies of social solidarity economy in our member cities and territories and at global level. Firstly, um, we are doing this um, especially by creating and facilitating opportunities for the exchange of good practices and knowledges between our member cities and organizations and beyond also with other partners. Uh, for instance, I would like to take an example of our uh, webinar series conducted last year from May to September to, uh, 2020 uh, as a preparatory process to the organization of GCEP 2020 Global Virtual Forum, which took place in October. That uh, many of those measures and initiatives uh, which are taken for economic and job recovery uh, implemented by our member cities uh, are very interesting. And, and I think that illustrates what I have just said. And I will just uh, quote uh, four examples. For instance, the city of Montreal in Canada, from the very beginning of the wake of this COVID-19 crisis has implemented financial aid and, and, and accompanying measures uh, targeted at the social solidarity economy sectors. So they have proposed the reduction of the mandatory contribution to the social economy development funds. And also they provide uh, physiological counseling programs and crisis management of human resources trainings and so on. And as social solidarity economy is recognized as a strategic sector for the recovery of COVID-19 at the very early stage, that even the city has invited the representative of social solidarity economy sectors to sit in the advisory committee for economic recovery um, put in place by the mayor. For the case of Seoul Metropolitan Government, among other measures, of course, the Seoul Metropolitan Government also has given a high priority to provide emergency survival funds uh, for the self-employees and, and many small uh, organizations, structures of social solidarity economy organizations and in small enterprise. But also they have developed an important program which foster a cooperation and partnership with small commerce and shop owners who are also very uh, badly affected in order to boost local economy, for instance, residential and district economy to uh, revive. And, and they have launched a campaign um, by social, social products, social economy products in order to save uh, decent work of those organizations. Actually, the uh, region of Nouvelle Aquitaine in France, for instance, also they have, they have taken several steps, steps to elevate short-term cash flow problems met by social solidarity economy entities, especially uh, those small ones through various loan and support funds. But also the region supported the sector in a multi-stakeholder approach through the organization of weekly social solidarity economy crisis unit. And in the long term, they are uh, preparing actually uh, of uh, 140 million euro recovery plan towards an ecological and economic transition of social solidarity economy organizations, focusing on local production and consumption. Just one case also from um, developing countries, Senegal, city of Dakar also has been supporting social solidarity economy organizations through among other initiatives, uh, rescheduling of repayment period through the municipal development and solidarity funds called for them 
but also through incubator for the promotion of employment through micro enterprise. Uh, so providing financial levers, but also facilitating the access of social solid economic organizations enterprise um, to public procurement opportunities, especially in terms of uh, orders, uh, ordering of masks and so on. So these are a few examples that how actually our member cities and, and territories uh, have responding uh, during the time of COVID-19 and how we were facilitating exchange of those strategies and measures uh, developed by those cities through a series of webinars. But uh, beyond of this time of crisis, generally that we also organize a regional police dialogue for each continent. So for African uh, uh, police dialogue, Asian police dialogue, European police dialogue, and Latin and Central American police dialogue in order to encourage the exchange of good practices and good uh, strategies developed by our member cities and organizations. So in 2019, we have organized um, the last U European police dialogue in Liverpool, uh, which was co-organized with the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. You will hear from Lynn Collins this afternoon and Drazen Sinesa also was present there uh, by sharing uh, the experience of uh, RIPES uh, Europe. The next, uh, I think secondly, I would like to talk about our work, uh, which consists to give a voice to our member organizations and networks in discussions at global level, especially in global political and development processes, as well as through advocacy actions and support. I just would like to mention only three, but uh, these are not the uh, exhaustive list. You can have uh, more detailed um, information at our website. But GSEF is an observer organization to the United Nations Task Force on Social Solid Economy, which is comprised by 17 UN agencies and 14 observer organizations since 2017, channeling uh, uh, ideas, uh, suggestions for the uh, good research projects or common activities we can develop, and also contributing to the agenda and the work of the UN Task Force. And for instance, this year, we are working very closely with the UN Task Force and also other countries to uh, propose a resolution uh, on social solidarity economy at the UN General Assembly. I think uh, there has never been a, a public and, and visible recognition by the UN that the social solidarity economy is a very important strategy for the development, for the more uh, integral uh, just and uh, resilient and development, especially in a time of crisis. So we are currently working uh, hard actually to uh, make this uh, resolution be adopted by the UN General Assembly. Secondly, we are uh, uh, working and, and um, collaborating uh, very closely with the OECD and currently we are uh, taking part in the OECD global action to promote social and solidarity ecosystems which um, are covering 27 EU member countries and six non-EU countries. So including Canada, Mexico, South Africa, India, and South Korea. So actually that uh, GCEF, we do have our members uh, and cities in all those countries. So we are um, actively going to uh, take part in, uh, in the consortium uh, uh, on legal framework to uh, facilitate peer learning partnership among those countries, but also among those, um, our members. We are also uh, quite engaged with advocacy work uh, for the adoption of the framework law on social solid economy. For instance, currently in Morocco, that our members, um, the Moroccan platform for social solidarity and environmental economy is, is working uh, for that, but also, in Cambodia, Senegal, and even uh, Republic of Korea that our member organizations and cities are working for, for the adoption of the uh, framework law on social solid economy. Thirdly, that we are uh, working a lot to facilitate access to funding opportunities, especially for our members in developing countries. For instance, 
uh, we try to focus on supporting more innovative and multi-stakeholder approach, uh, and as well as initiatives which are lasting impact, uh, which are bringing lasting impact on communities. For instance, during last year, that uh, since uh, this unexpected COVID-19 pandemic has uh, hit it so badly all economic organizations, but particularly those social solid economic organizations in developing countries, uh, with other social solid economic networks in Korea that we have uh, uh, discussed and, and convinced the Korea International Cooperation Agency, COICA, to provide emergence aid program um, uh, for the COVID-19 to the social solid economic organizations and enterprise in developing countries, especially with the purpose to preserve uh, their income generating activities and uh, decent jobs through this um, program. And um, it was uh, actually that uh, there are 35 projects are supported in 22 countries. And GSEF, we have uh, participated in this program with our six members uh, from Cameroon, Togo, uh, Togo uh, Uganda, uh, Morocco, Cambodia, and uh, Senegal. And I would like to uh, mention very briefly about the impact of this program. Even though that uh, this was an uh, emergence uh, aid with a very limited financial contribution for a very limited period, uh, we have noticed that uh, this kind of support has produced a very impactful outcomes of the, uh, of, of the project, especially for the social solidarity economy organization enterprise. Uh, in terms of short and mid-term impact, the majority of those social solid economy organizations and enterprises were able to preserve their income level, especially uh, maintaining income generating activities and, and their employment in the communities. Actually, 100% of those organizations who uh, have received this uh, aid uh, have um, stated that they this had been a very, very crucial an important support. And in terms of long-term impact, that uh, many of those social and economic organization enterprise have identified what should be the strategy for the future development of their activities in order to respond to the emerging social needs. So for instance, they have identified the digital skills are very important uh, for the transition of social and economic sectors and new sectors like um, uh, combining ecological uh, uh, commitment and transitions with also social economic uh, activities and uh, many tools like uh, uh, building, uh, you know, uh, coordinated and collaborated platforms uh, for the common purpose of uh, distributing and commercializing of their product and etc. So uh, this has been a very important opportunity for them to identify key strategies and key areas that they have to work in order to uh, explore their potentials and their uh, possibilities in the post-COVID recovery. So uh, uh, this has been a very important, I think, long-term impact. Just let me give uh, uh, you know, uh, three concrete examples. So just what I have said in terms of long-term impact, uh, some uh, countries are focusing on the promotion of short supply chains uh, through improvement of distribution channels and uh, managerial practice of dozens of women cooperatives. Such as this is in the case of Cameroon. As already I have mentioned, for instance, uh, both in Cambodia and Dogo, that because they are more young uh, entrepreneurs, so uh, our member organization, which is called Pare Circus, um, which is a, a, a social enterprise of youth uh, artists uh, operating in culture and art performance. And since they were 100% hit by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis, and as they are very dependent on foreign tourist flow uh, into their country, that they have uh, developed uh, an online store and they have developed even an online art performance uh, and they are trying to uh, uh, 
uh, raise the funds through uh, international campaigns, through uh, online performance. And, and in Togo, uh, especially because also they are young uh, cooperatives and, and entrepreneurs working in rural areas, and they see the development of a digital platform connecting social solidarity economy producers and customers are very important in their country. So they have developed this platform for 60 so social solidarity economy stakeholders uh, trained on how to use these digital tools. And at the same time, through those activities, and they are strengthening of social solidarity ecosystems, as we already have mentioned, that Morocco is developing frame um, law and social solidarity economy in Dogo. Uh, these young youth entrepreneurs of social solidarity economy uh, enterprise and, and organizations, they are uh, currently working very closely with local authorities who are involved in this project, including in the follow-up monitoring phase and discussing about also developing more conducive public policies to support social solidarity economy. Next uh, area of our work is consisting to provide access to technical support and expertise on various issues through a pool of expert and publications. And currently that actually we are focusing a lot on providing a more theoretical framework uh, of ecosystem with a very concrete uh, case and examples from various cities and territories to the gov uh, local government officials uh, to uh, learn and to uh, build their capacities on how to develop uh, public policies for the social solidarity economy. So uh, we have initiated this uh, tailored training for the local government officials since 2019. And currently since yesterday, we are conducting this four day long capacity building programs for the government uh, officials and, and social solidarity economy uh, leaders coming from 15 countries. Uh, they are about 35 um, and jointly organized with the uh, UCLG, International Association of Local Government and Cities in Africa. Uh, and we are also going to have uh, four uh, English uh, African countries at the end of June. And uh, in order to do this, uh, you know, providing capacity building programs and, and you know, uh, uh, expertise, especially on various issues, we have conducted since last year uh, uh, a research study and guidelines for local government for uh, the public policies of social solidarity economy, especially uh, with uh, United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. And uh, with these guidelines, we have also published seven city cases, concretely uh, showing very diverse and different ecosystem which is developed in uh, Seoul, Montreal, Barcelona, Mexico, Durban, and Dakar, uh, and also Riverfield. Uh, since I don't have much time, that uh, if you are interested in these guidelines as well as the seven city case studies, please visit our website and. And if you are more interested to know about some European cities, which are part of this project, uh, how they have developed and, and what are their, uh, you know, uh, positive sides and what are their uh, challenges and, and difficulties that they encounter, you are all invited to attend our section uh, of GSEF, which will be organized during the European Social Economic Summit. Um, which will take place from 26 to 27 May. And our section is going to be on 26 May, 2021 from 3 to 4.30 PM. So visit our website also for more information. Very quickly, my last point, uh, but this is an important point because uh, in order to do all uh, of these uh, activities, um, you know, uh, at uh, one uh, site, to give a global perspective, but also a global uh, gathering, we are organizing uh, exactly the same name as our network, Global Social Economy Forum, every two years on rotation from one continent to another. So the first and second um, forum was organized in Seoul, and third uh, Global Economy Forum was organized in the city of Montreal. The fourth 
Global Social Economy Forum was organized in Bilbao uh, for Europe. And this year, we are going to have our fifth edition of this forum, which will uh, take place most probably in hybrid format, but the majority will be connected through online. Uh, and this forum is hosted by the city of Mexico and federal government uh, of Mexico, especially uh, um, Institute of National Institute of Promotion for Social Economy. So um, this uh, fifth edition of Global Social Economy Forum is going to take place from 4th to 8th October 2021. And currently the call for proposals is open till the 5th of May on the five dens. And uh, there are two categories where you can participate through individual initiative that you would like to share or, or organizing uh, your self-organized sections uh, with your members and partners if you like. So more information are available on our website. Please visit our website. So this is what uh, I have prepared to share with you. Uh, of course, I'm ready to answer to your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Hubala Bam Puno. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. So uh, if you have a questions, please. Uh, Please, uh, you can uh, now ask uh, Lawrence because she's also uh, don't have uh, too much time uh, to be with us because she's uh, on her move to uh, another task. So, Lawrence, one question is uh, for you is um, basically how you see uh, this now. You now you present us a really uh, amazing. Um, amazing work on legal issues, uh, financial support, uh, networking uh, of uh, cities and region for SSC. <clears throat> and how you, uh, how you see uh, the future time regarding uh, that basically all action plans and strategies that were uh, created before uh, 2019 are obsolete at this moment and we need to create a new one. Do you see uh, potentials for SSC uh, on public policies uh, for this uh, cause? Or uh, maybe you think that it will be even uh, too, too big work uh, for all of us because uh, now everyone needs to create something more, something more solidarity, something more sustainable, something more resilient. Yes, I think, um, Draken, thank you very much for this question. I think this question is very important. Of course, like our network, as much as all other social uh, solidarity economic organizations and, and enterprise and networks, uh, this is a very uh, challenging time and, and time of trial. So many are actually affected uh, so badly, so they are striving to uh, survive and to exist. But at the same time, as I said, uh, so many governments, both national and local governments, public policy makers, international organizations are all looking at social solidarity economy that saying that uh, you are the only uh, alternative policy that which will allow us to rebuild uh, post COVID-19 um, era in a more resilient, more equitable, more sustainable manner, and so on and so on. So actually that there are a lot of great expectations coming from those government policymakers, international organizations, seeing a very positive aspect and potential role that social solidarity economy can play. But at the same time, as we all know, that uh, we are very rich and diverse uh, ecosystem of uh, different organizations but we are not um, a, you know, uh, well organized, I would say in terms of uh, one structure or, or one sector. Uh, of course, I think this great diversity um, and you know, uh, very rooted in the local level is, is also our strength and our positive aspect. But in order to respect to such a time of crisis, and this could be a, a handicap. Also, the another point is that many of those uh, social solidarity economy organization enterprise are the small scale and uh, structure of a very small and medium enterprise, 
employing a quite limited number of people. So compared to those expectations and uh, role and leadership to be played for the transitional period uh, from this crisis to more human, resilient, inclusive and sustainable development. And actually that uh, probably uh, social service economy sector is not uh, yet um, ready, both in terms of capacities as well as uh, uh, you know, political leadership. So I think there are a lot of those discussions going on, especially also among the international network of social solid economy like us. So currently we are discussing a lot with uh, International Cooperative Alliance, uh, GSEF, and International Forum of Social Solid Economy. And, and certainly we will invite RIPES International as well as CDAC and others to have an international coalition of international social solid economy networks in order to respond to some of those demands and especially uh, positioning with more visible and recognized role and which will be followed by the uh, more political support as well as measures from various governments. I think to scale up of social solid economic uh, organizations, um, you know, uh, leadership as well as capacity, uh, of course we need uh, governments who have to provide, uh, you know, uh, political framework, legal framework, also with financial means to uh, support uh, those efforts of social and economic sectors. That's why I think GSEF is promoting a lot uh, this close partnership and even co-creative or co governed ecosystem between uh, local government and, and social and economic organizations. So I think this, it is a very interesting and challenging time for us because um, uh, we are visibly recognized and even the General Secretary of the United Nations has mentioned in his report for the just transition to the sustainable development uh, after the COVID-19. He said the social and economy is the best place actually to address those uh, issues combining uh, efficiency of ec uh, economic transition, but with also uh, social and environmental uh, challenges. So the, uh, I think there are uh, opening of this uh, political recognition and political support. Uh, it's now time for us, you know, to respond with uh, renewed capacities, very creative and innovative uh, responses. And that requires a, a very close collaboration with government, but also very close uh, uh, cooperation and, and uh, alliance among social and economic organizations and networks. Okay. I hope that I have yeah. responded to your question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we will now go on with our program and uh, wish you all the best and good uh, luck with the amazing work that you are doing in, uh, in GSF. Thank you very much, Drajan, because I'm really very happy uh, to be with you. And sorry that I cannot stay until the end of the day because we have our pro ongoing program. But thanks, thanks a lot uh, once again for this invitation. Hubala. Bye, take care. Bye. Thank you. Uh, ok, uh, sada ćemo samo pričekati da nam se uključi gospodin uh, Luigi Martinjeti koji je zapravo uh, ima istu funkciju generalni sekretarije, ali evropske mreže za uh, društvenu ekonomiju gradova i regija. Tako da će nam on dati perspektivu, uh, možemo reći, s naše kontinenta. Ovo je bila jedna globalna uh, globalni pregled od šta se sve radi u ovom području na razini gradova i regija pa i država, a sada ćemo vidjeti evropski primjer. Imamo li ga uključenog? Luigi, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hi. Just connecting. Okay, uh, so with, uh, sorry for this short delay. You will you will have uh, your ta time as we planned. Uh, so, 
uh, to all of our participants. Uh, with us uh, is Luigi Martinetti, who is the General Secretary of Reves, which is a European network of cities and regions for the social economy. And he will uh, present us uh, the work of the network and also what are uh, current situation uh, within uh, members of the network with uh, uh, using social economy tools and values and public policies uh, in this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So Luigi, uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Drazen. Uh, can, can you, you just please share your presentation? Uh, you can I'm, do it by I'm yourself. I'm actually sharing. Okay, I'm we sharing. are seeing it. Okay, very good. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It would have been far better to be with you in Croatia, as always, obviously. Uh, not only this time. Uh, I will try to share with you some reflections more than, uh, than a simple presentation, if you agree with this. Uh, actually, uh, if the point is, if the question is what the network can do in order to, uh, to, to support the development of local social economy, a network of public authorities, uh, then I, I, think, I think as REV we have something to, uh, to share on, on, from that point of view. First of all, um, I'm not even sure that we can still talk about a, a network when we talk about REV as probably we should talk about a partnership. Uh, our network was started back in the middle of the 90s uh, as a, from, from a, a small group of public authorities, not capitals, but really uh, public authorities wishing to develop a stronger relationship, a stronger partnership between them in order to promote the idea of partnership in itself. Actually, started everything started with the, the meeting between the mayor of Ostersund, this is in the middle of Sweden. Well, look at from, 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 uh, from our point of view, this is very north, but for them it's the middle of Sweden. And the mayor of Reggio di Calabria, that is a city in southern Italy. Uh, and they met in the framework of a European program uh, with the idea that it was important to, uh, to share the interest for uh, pursuing the general interest uh, and the well-being of all citizens between public authorities and social economy. Uh, in the beginning, there were 17. Since then, we, we, we have been growing up, putting a limit for the time being at 50 members, uh, but we are nowadays present in 15 European countries. Uh, it is important that I would like to say something talking about the COVID-19. It's true the COVID-19 came as a, as some as a, as a change maker in our activities the activities of all of us uh, but it's important also to know that there were activities running that could not stop could not possibly stop what, what do i mean by this i mean that i think that the most important thing we had in this period is the fact that our members did not stop their policies for the promotion of social economy the policies which were running I could mention, for instance, the Catalan region in, uh, in Spain with this Ateneo Cooperativo, that is a program for the development of, uh, of, of cooperative, uh, cooperative enterprises, but also, and I think I already mentioned once uh, in, in a similar meeting, but also uh, the region of Tuscany that has been elaborating its own law for the promotion of social economy in the middle of the pandemic crisis. Uh, or, or, or Brussels Capital, its COP city action uh, for the uh, inclusion of, uh, of persons far that, uh, that they by the employment market, or even the, this, this strategy from Orebro for the development of social economy, uh, the partnership development, co-construction of partnership for social economy, or even Torres Vedras in Portugal, that is nowadays one of the five capitals of European capitals of social economy. Uh, they have been work continuing with the idea of, uh, of developing short chains for the sustainability of food uh, in, uh, in, and sustainability and, and natural quality of foods in the schools. So what do I mean is that 
we we should be able of thinking that in order to come out of this crisis we have to build on what we had before and what has been still existing during all this period uh, the idea that we can create something brand new and this will take out of this of the covid-19 crisis i'm afraid is not sustainable it's just trying to put a a, a cushion in in a in a situation that is structural it's not uh, just the epidemic situation that has been generating the situation where we are right now. I'm talking from a European point of view, and as we are a European network, and I will come to our policies in a minute, but I would like just to remind you that uh, in, at the end of 2019, the most important European program, that is the uh, cohesion policy programs, was blocked. And, and was not blocked by the, the COVID-19 crisis, Were blocked, was blocked by the difficulties that governments had to find a common ground. Uh, so we, we, we should avoid thinking that before everything was fine and after everything is bad. We were already in a situation that, that was, uh, uh, can I say, conducive for a crisis like the one we, were, we are facing right now. Um, Going back to our network, it is important to underline that we are a value-driven partnership. Uh, we are not an, a simple exchange network. No, it's important. Exchange is important and it's part of our activity, but we have a background. We we are those public authorities, regional, local public authorities, and those social economy organizations that share some objectives and these are our objectives uh, you see here uh, the creation of long-term collaboration is an objective it doesn't mean that we are uh, creating collaborations collabor uh, collaborations and partnership just to face one problem we create partnership because it is important to do that because this improves the quality of life in our cities uh, and our regions, uh, create a culture of social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship is not only a, a, a problem solving instrument. Social entrepreneurship is another way of doing economy. So we have to, to take this as a basis because otherwise we might have problems in understanding how to fit social economy into the pre-existing system, into the triangular system where Public authorities are on the on the one hand, uh, traditional enterprises, not social enterprises, are on the other hand, and the social economy stays at the other uh, at the at the other extreme of the triangle. Um, we have been developing also the idea that we should work for a global social responsibility, which means we have to promote a participative popular democracy in all decision-making process. We cannot just rely on the goodwill or on the on, or, of some enterprises or on the goodwill of some entrepreneurs. We should involve citizens in the making of social responsibility, taking this as a basis for any kind of policies in this sense. Also, obviously, and this is something we always forget, we have to insist and, and insist upon uh, all the uh, equal opportunity issues, not only gender equality, but also racial equality, and fight any, any kind of violence. And we are still facing in Europe a lot of these kind of experiences. Um, co-design, co-construction, developing new models of, 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 uh, of governance is at the basis of any collaborations. If we are unable to develop good models of governance, I could quote, I know that after me uh, in the afternoon there will be uh, Patricia Andriot from uh, R2S and she will probably mention the fantastic examples France has been developing in terms of co-governance, co-construction and co-design of experiences. We have to build on this. And when I do, when I, when I say we have to build on this, I refer to the necessity to work with central governments and with European Union in our case as a final objective, because we have to create the conditions for social economy to develop and for partnership to develop. 
social economy is an, a player in the pursuit of sustainable, socially sustainable territories. We do not support social economy because we like the idea. We support social economy because it is a constituency of a socially responsible territory. And this is important to keep in mind. How do we act? Uh, Rev act at three levels. First of all, the policy making. Policy making means policy making at local level and policy making at European and worldwide level. Uh, some examples. The first action REV did in 1996 was to create the policy conditions to introduce social economy and local level into the European employment strategy, the Luxembourg strategy, so called, that was then approved in 1997. Uh, the REV members contributed physically to the writing on priority number 12 of that strategy. Uh, REV has been working during all these years in creating the conditions for introducing instruments of co-design, of participation in the programming phases of the cohesion of the European cohesion policy. I'm talking about community and local development. I'm talking about social economy introduced today as a priority under the ESF program. Yeah, uh, this means creating a policy dialogue with the, between the European institutions and the local level, because the local level has the, 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 the perception on, on what is going on, what is really needed. Uh, it Brussels is far, uh, how we very often say, you know, everybody of us, I mean, but it's, it's far just because we do not dialogue, we do not enter in a dialogue with them. Uh, we have to show how why it is important, but also how to make it. I make another, another example, a public procurement. Uh, the, the present directive on public procurement has a lot of contribution, had a lot of contribution from social economy and from REV, in particular being also REV a funding member of Social Economy Europe, uh, because this is still the instrument that very often regulates the relationship, the economic relationship between social economy and public authorities. Well, we, are, we have been working in order to improve the capacity of public procurement to work in this direction. And right now, we are working in order to exclude a social economy from the field of application of public procurement. It does not mean that we cannot establish economic partnerships between social economy and public authorities. We mean that in the future, we want to have a situation where these kind of partnerships do not uh, pertain, pertain to the internal market regulation and therefore to the public procurement regulation. Uh, we are working at the European level, but we are working also with the OECD. I heard that before was mentioned, the global action from the OECD, uh, among which we have also the, uh, this operation that we have been writing on creating legal frameworks, uh, conducive legal, a PLP on a, conducting uh, legal frameworks for social economy. This is only part of the job because this is the learning partnership that we have been elaborating, being able to involve national governments and regional governments from all the countries involved in the partnership. And this is important because usually, and you have this experience for sure, the dialogue between the regional, the local level and the national one it's not so evident in many cases. Uh, but what is important is that this PLP that starts right now, uh, I mean, uh, in, in the afternoon, I have the, the, the first meeting of the steering of this operation, uh, is only part of it, because we have been also collaborating with USD in the elaboration of policy papers that the European Commission, that is the, the final financer of this operation we then use. And we'll use in something that is essential and that is crucial in this moment, that is the uh, future action plan, European action plan for social economy. I will talk about this in the rest of, the, of my presentation, if you don't mind. But first, before that, I would like to uh, underline also other two functions we carry out, other two things this partnership does. First of all, competence bearing, sharing and competence building our territories are, uh, are reserves of 
collective intelligence, the, the, the amount of experiences, the amount of competencies we have in our territories is incredibly wide. Uh, we need to be able to share this kind of competencies. And where we do not arrive with sharing, we have to start building. Uh, uh, the experiences I've been quoting before, the, the experience from, uh, from Catalonia, from Tuscany, from Brussels capital, from Torres Vedras, but I could quote also soon, Orebrug, Gothenburg, and so on and so forth. Uh, they have been, uh, in a way, they have been taken from each other. They have been inspiring each other each other. We perfectly know that the contexts are different, different from one country to another, but we also know that inspiration is important. And also talking about Euro, we know that we have a common uh, legal background behind us that is the European Union. So how learning how to better use European social fund is a value but in order to learn this, we cannot just share experience. We have to share the how, how you did it, how uh, the uh, Catalonia region did in order to finance the Ateneus with the European Social Fund. Or talking about public procurement, how did Tuscany region to have a public procurement of 40 million euros limited, reserved, to social cooperatives, but we need to know really how concretely. We have been carrying out an operation together with the European Commission in order to share this kind of experiences in 2018, and we hope we will do also in the future, and we hope that you will be involved as well. And the last point is innovation, experimentation. Uh, when you have a partnership, uh, at a certain stage, you, you realize that you can create something new, that maybe something would have been too much for your territory. It's not that much if the territories are five or ten. We can share the cost of innovation because innovation costs. We can share the cost of experimentation. We might also uh, maybe uh, elaborate and find a way to create financing for this kind of operation. By the way, one of the operations uh, of this kind where the network has been involved directly is the creation of a microcredit bank. Okay, microcredit is not very important for us, but it's very, very important for those kind of micro experiences we have in many of our territories. And this microcredit is probably the, the only one who has a, an authorization to act everywhere in Europe, not only in, in one country as usual. Uh, but I would like now to, as we are talking about Europe, I would like to, to, to share with you, and, uh, and as I think also I am taking a bit too much time, yeah. But I would like to share with you, if I still have time, a few challenges we have in 2021. Challenges which are directly related with EU legislation and with the future uh, social economy action plan. First of all, we have to make the most of the partnership principle. Partnership is not only a, uh, a formal uh, process, a formal move, is not only inviting people in the monitoring committee of the European Social Fund, for instance, is really co-designing uh, programs and policies. We have to keep the local perspective as a reference for any policy action. I make an example, the next generation EU program in many, many countries, all this uh, amount, big amount of money is passing very high, very far from the territory. I mean, for in order to finance so-called strategic initiatives. Okay, I don't say that we do not, do not have to finance strategic initiatives, but we need to have the local perspective because we need to have a clear overview on what is the, the impact at the local level of these big European strategies or national strategies. We have to improve the accessibility of policy action and, and, and programs for the local territories and for the social economy. And we, have, we need to go beyond sector-specific actions because it's very important to support the sectors, but we have to look at social economy as a context, as an environment. Then we have to improve uh, clustering. I could spend, well, uh, I invite you to join our users conference on 29th of April, Road to Mannheim, on this topic. Because clustering, I said before, uh, has to be made of equals, which means public authorities, social economy, and non-social economy enterprises. We have to improve conducive legal ecosystems, as I already said. 
uh, but we have to work on a lot of other things like state aid regulations, for instance. Why, why are we forgetting about this? But we have to come with proposals. We cannot just say, please change your state aid regulation. We have to explain how and why they, these have to change. Uh, then we have to improve the financial context for our social economy and community initiatives. The European Federation of uh, Alternative Banks, uh, FEBEA, is, uh, is uh, turning 20 this year, and they've been asking us as public authorities to, uh, to exchange with them in order to see how we can improve alternative financing. Our members are nowadays collecting information and ideas around this. We have to increase the understanding of the role of non-commercial initiatives. Very often we talk about social economy and we refer to social enterprises, and this is very important, but there are also there is a huge number of non-commercial initiatives, non-enterprises in the, in the national definitions, but enterprises in European one uh, that very often are forgot. An example, in my region, we have 3,200 registered uh, organizations under the Social and Solidarity Economy Registry, but we know that there are more than 100,000 organizations which are not registered, simply because they do not enter in any kind of relationship with the public authority. And this is a loss, really a loss. Uh, I'm coming to the, to the end. Uh, first of all, um, we have to start a global revision of the rule applicable to uh, local social economy based initiatives, as I was already saying, for instance, public procurement re regulation that has to change. Uh, we have to develop cooperative approaches to digital transition. I was very happy today because I learned about other two examples, one in Brussels of, um, of uh, support to cooperative approaches to digital to, to, to the digital transition. So new cooperative platforms. Well, I already knew of a cooperative platform supported by the city of Bologna in Italy, but now I, I also learned of the initiative of uh, Brussels Capital to create his own platform in order to support local micro commerces uh, against the, uh, the, 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 the impossibility they have to react and to resist to global initiatives in this sense then increase the participation of local communities in the green transition. Uh, we cannot think of doing any kind of green transition without the local. And I'm talking also about the rural dimensions, because we are talking very often, and, and we, found that the, we find that the present programming period is starting very much under this uh, sense. Uh, we, we focus very often on big urban areas, and we tend to forget the rural dimensions. But the rural dimensions are key in order to develop green transition. Because at the end of the day, this is the natural part, not the cities. We could uh, try and transform uh, metropolitan areas uh, to make them more green, but we cannot forget that outside the, the uh, uh, metropolitan areas, we have, uh, we have the countryside. And the countryside in many countries is almost abandoned unless it is very productive from an agricultural point of view. So I'm thinking about mountains, mountain economy and all this. We are developing right now with uh, uh, one of our members from the Alps, Italian Alps, uh, a project in order to, uh, to help local small farmers to study uh, the capacity of, of, uh, of fields to produce over 2,000 meters of altitude. Okay, uh, I will not enter in details for this. Actually, this is uh, what we are doing at REV, and this is what I think we should, we will continue for, for sure uh, doing, and, and, and what I think that the European Union should be more keen on. We have an occasion, the action plan uh, for social economy, we have an interest, the global action from the OECD, we need to take advantage from them. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. So, uh, before our next break, uh, please uh, prepare questions uh, for Luigi. Uh, one question for you is, um, you uh, really well explain what is value-driven partnership for you and how it is, uh, needs to uh, happen on a local uh, level. Uh, can you uh, explain how you see uh, and what is the Reves' role in it in this um, 
uh, public policy on European level, on, on the level of European Union, uh, in uh, which one you participate uh, and how you see this relationship uh, between European public policies and uh, impact on uh, country members and on local level uh, uh, in, the, in the Union. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I forgot to say, actually. Yes, we, uh, we are involved in... Uh, we are members in the structured dialogue, in the social dialogue with DG Employment, and we are members of the European... I'm personally a member of the European Expert Group on Cohesion Policy with DG Regio. These two DGs uh, of the European Commission are those actually managing the European Regional Structural um, Development Fund, and the European Social Fund. At the same time, we are also uh, observers in the, in the Committee of the Regions, that, as you know, has a, has a role in the, in the evaluation and, and the building up of, uh, of uh, European policies from this point of view. Well, to tell the truth, the European Commission is very keen on listening and learning how to improve the, uh, the impact of European policies on the local level, how to improve the sustainability of European policies on the local level. I think that the real problem is in the, in the passage of information and knowledge between the European Commission and the local level. I try to explain myself. European Commission speaks a language that for many territories is a foreign language. Uh, the European Commission is asking us to report, uh, for instance, on the implementation of the partnership principle. We have the European Code of Conduct on Partnership. That's good. But when I talk to my local partners, and I'm talk not talking about regions, but about the city, first I have to explain what is, according to the European Commission, uh, the uh, implementation of partnership principle. Or what is a CLLD? Then I say, well, is a local action plan and they and very often they understand because it's linked to the to the legs from uh, from the uh, rural uh, development uh, policy uh, the difficult part is really to bring european commission and local levels to talk the same language and to understand each other once this is done it is also easier to identify, to, to start a, a, a real dialogue with the European Commission. It is not true that the European Commission is far and doesn't listen. The European Commission listens, maybe sometimes do not understand, but very often listen to what territories say. And I think that this initiative of the Social Economy Action Plan is, is very much the, the consequence of this. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, initiative has some roots. As, uh, as some roots, for instance, in the, uh, in, in the, in the conclusions of the uh, Luxembourg uh, Council on Social Economy 2015, and also in the work of the European Parliament Intergroup for Social Economy, where also Rev is an observer. The European Parliament Intergroup on Social Economy is made, is composed of members of the Parliament from all the group policy groups, excluding the far right, and uh, this is really the place where we can create a, 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 a short circuit between the, uh, the, 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 the needs of territories and the need of the policy making at the European level. Uh, in 2015, by the way, this group, when, when all the, the, the process that is bringing to the action plan started, the chairperson of the group was... Uh, uh, Jens Nielsen, who by, by chance was the guy I mentioned in the beginning, the mayor of Osasund, in the middle of the 90s when REV was created. Okay, do we, thank you. Do we have uh, some another question from, from the audience? Maybe, maybe if you can uh, uh, explain uh, shortly, because of uh, our uh, city representatives, uh, what, for example, one city or region need to do to become 
member of Reves. What is the procedure, if you can explain yeah. in some short? Well, uh, well, first of all, you saw that in my slides there were all the principles. Uh, and the first step is to agree with those principles. And, uh, and then simply to send a, a, a letter to the address to the president of REV uh, asking for uh, membership into, into the network. And then the board of directors uh, check and accept, well, very difficult that the city is not accepted as a member. And I think that also this is an information you, you probably next information you would ask is how does it, how much does it cost? Probably, no, am, am I wrong? Uh, actually, there is a, a yearly membership fee that is calculated on the basis of the number of inhabitants of the cities and also the, uh, for, for, uh, for some countries of the European Union, the uh, internal uh, product by uh, per capita, which means that there is a, a, a balancing between, uh, uh, between richer and, and poorer countries sorry for using this kind of very <laughs> direct term terminology of the European Union. But if, if, uh, if, if you're interested in learning more, you can also write me. I think that Drazen can share my, 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 connect, my, my details and I will be happy to provide more information. Can be members of REF, public authorities and social economy organization platforms uh, from the local and regional level. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Thank you for your time uh, and for joining us and wish you uh, that you continue with uh, good, good work and promote of social economy on local and also on uh, European level. Thank you so much and I hope that uh, hopefully in the future you will also have a members for, from and, Croatia. No, and, I, I, and I hope that we, I will be able to come back again to Croatia because now it's has been yes. a while since I was not in your wonderful country. Okay, thank you so much. Now we will have a break uh, in our conference and we will continue with the program from uh, 2 p.m. So thank you and enjoy.
uh, as I told you, I don't uh, read everything I have in my present in my presentation, but. Uh, Okay, we can continue with the conference. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Patricia Andrit and to thank her really a lot because uh, he jumped in in the conference in uh, late call. So, Patricia uh, has many, let's say, heads. Uh, she is a councillor of uh, Commune uh, Oberiv. Van Jean Monsejone, I hope right. I didn't uh, read completely wrong. Sorry no, for no, that, it's okay. Patricia. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, she is also active member of uh, local uh, LAG, local action group, which is also interesting for us in Croatia. So, she has a, an experience how to promote social and solidarity economy in rural area, and she is also uh, a vice president of uh, French uh, network of local authorities for solidarity economy. So she also has an experience of networking for this uh, sector on, on the level of uh, uh, public policies and representatives of uh, cities and regions. And she's also active on European level and communicating with other partners, other cities and region. So, Patricia, thank you a lot for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you much. Thank you much, and thank you much for your invitation, uh, because it's always very interesting to uh, not just to have an exhibition, but to hear those uh, experience. And uh, sorry about my uh, poor English and uh, maybe about my pronunciation. Uh, on my presentation uh, on slide, there will be more things uh, will be right than I will read, but you will have the presentation and uh, you will have more details and it's very easy and possible to contact me. Uh, I could give you a conversation and chat uh, my uh, web address to if you have more questions of the, the presentation. So um, I will try to explain how we try to go towards a good economy uh, on our territory. So first, uh, so some words about uh, where I live and where about our territory. So we are in France, in the east part of France. So you see this small uh, uh, green uh, place. Um, and um, it's a very, uh, not far from Dijon. We are in the Grand Est region. Uh, it's a very rural uh, community because um, we have a um, um, group of communities, of three communities, who call uh, uh, Pays de Langres. Uh, it's a local place to live. Uh, and uh, we have uh, 168 municipalities for uh, 47,000 uh, inhabitants for... 2,000 to 16 kilometers scary. So you see, we have a very less, very poor density, uh, and it's why we are very rural. Uh, it's a very rural context. So how many activities are agriculture, forestry, industrial, subcontracting, and um, we have a specific activities about logistic transportation, and um, of course, we have a problematic about uh, personal services. Uh, other things maybe too important to say is we, it, it, we have a significant proportion of the population is over 60 years old. Maybe there is a transition in Croatia and I have to speak more slowly. You have to tell me because I know very often I, I speak too quick. So let me know if it's necessary. So... Um, what are the main keys uh, issues uh, in moving towards transition? First of it, we are a rural place, but we have a very we have an, a subject about environmental because uh, we um, we we say we are the water store of France because a lot of uh, uh, white spring uh, take place in our territories. 
and um, for to go in the Mediterranean Sea or in the Atlantic Sea, or so we have a specific place with the water. So we have to be very careful this water place. And uh, we have a naturalness of this area. So biodiversity is very important and environmental subject is very important. But we have an intensive uh, agricultural too. So of course we have some conflicts of activities. Now we have a national park, uh, just uh, seen uh, one year. So it's a good tool to protect uh, natural. We have another subject about agricultural because we, I will speak about uh, uh, later, but we have a challenge of local food governance, governance but, sorry. Uh, and uh, we make a special plan about it to support agriculture and to be exemplary. We have another subject about uh, mobility, mobility issues, because we are between Paris, Lyon, or uh, Strasbourg, or Belgium, or, or Italy. And uh, we have a problematic about intercity mobility, because we have, uh, um, we have motorway, uh, and we have some uh, small line of uh, train, but we have to fight to, to keep uh, this uh, small line. And uh, we have a problematic about uh, local mobility, soft mobility, with uh, maybe bicycle or maybe because we have in rural area, so um, care is very, very important for us. We have a challenge to welcoming tourists because we have a national park, uh, as already I told you. We have a challenge to maintain local services uh, and services for family, for child, but for elderly too. And we have a challenge to maintain an economic fabrics. We have uh, many small subcontracting companies, as I told, already told you. And, uh, but some sectors to have to be consolidated, no, um, especially in forestry fields. We have a lot of forestry, but we have a poor added value about forestry. So, what uh, it's very important for us to develop social economy in this place and what socio why social economy is a pillar for transition. Um, you have to know that the social economy already occupies a large place. We have many associations uh, to play an economic role. Maybe uh, for us, the association is 20% of employment and its association gives services in, with elderly, with children, so it's important for us. Uh, because services are not provided uh, all time by the, market, by the market, because the population is too low, right? it, it, there is no solvability. So it's why we have to make some services with association. Um, as I already told you, the territory choice uh, to have a local food project and uh, we decide to improve uh, the local food in uh, school me in school meal in school uh, food and uh, because we have public uh, public procurement sorry and uh, it's a good uh, impact on the good level uh, to us to try to we would like in five years to have uh, maybe 3,000 or 4,000 meal who come from local food. Now we have just, uh, as uh, you could read it, um, 500. About environment, the, it's the most complicated, most complex subject for us. The main need is we have more, more engineering for communities, for local authorities because we have two dependent for external consultancy and uh, it's very expensive uh, skills and uh, we need to have uh, more about. So I give you just some facts about uh, what are you mind, what are we, our main challenge. So, how, and we know at national level, the social economy uh, is uh, more uh, 15, uh, 17, more 17 uh, percent of uh, employment in rural territories. And this economy cro crops, uh, this economy grow. And uh, as the uh, other economy dec decrease during the uh, subprime uh, crisis. 
So more concretely, what action? Some example, just some example. About local food, we have a one action plan we take place in this sense. And uh, we just uh, have been certified by the state and we have some sub-ideas sub about it in the, in the framework of uh, relance plan, French relance plan, French and European relance plan. So we will have sub-ideas to make, uh, for example, a local uh, kitchen to make some transformation about meal with local produce. It's a concrete example. About the environment, uh, we have an awareness underway. The most challenge is to uh, give more uh, confidence with people. Uh, so we have a report from society, civil society because we have an organization with civil society to give some counsel or some advice to the elective people. And we have some uh, urban planning chain and we have the national park. So we have some tools. Uh, to lead and to improve the protection of the richness of biodiversity and water quality. But it's not easy because we have a lot of uh, form uh, habits, form habits from using who don't uh, go in this sense. About around the economy, uh, we have a project, and just an example, but we, I say we have, uh, it's poo for us, uh, the economy in forestry is too poor, but now we have a project about the forestry management on school, which use uh, friendly techniques, friendly environmental techniques. And it's not, uh, it's a project the, since 30 years, we have a specific management of our forestry uh, with not a very f strong pressure about forest, forest. And we would like to make a school to give this, this experience uh, in uh, France, but in Europe, because it is an European project. So we hope, uh, and we have, uh, it's okay. This project is okay now. So we hope uh, it will be a good uh, experience to develop uh, another, a good economy in forestry. The uh, last things, like last example, we have uh, about our own services to people. We have a coordination of the supply of supply of services for early childhood with the community, with local authorities, and uh, we would like uh, maybe go towards a cooperative. Um, and, um, but we have need a strong need of uh, manpower in the sector of assistance to the adults. So we have to work about this last subject, but uh, it's not uh, yet. Um, to sum up, maybe what my challenges and condition to success. My challenges is um, um, lack of engineering. As I already told you, uh, it's a big challenge for us. To, uh, it's, we have too poor uh, engineering to to help us to have some good subsidies or to think about project and to have a global vision or something like that. Uh, the subject to have uh, about uh, confidence and awareness of fundamental issues uh, and the urgency, the emergency of this subject is very important. And in my opinion, in my personal opinion, uh, we are to to less, uh, not more strong about this subject. One of the difficulties we have is the low demographic because it's very difficult to set up an economy specific, to set up a marketplace because uh, we know it's not, uh, we have no solvability in many services. Another subject is the place of young people. We have young people uh, let the, this place to go make such studies in a urban place, and uh, some come back, but many of them never come back. So it's a problem because uh, uh, we lost some, some skillness for our territories. And maybe another problem is, uh, I, in my opinion, it's a very important problem, but uh, few people know that, it's we have a lack of uh, territorial ambition. Uh, we will be a territory who have a difficulty to believe in, its, in itself. It's why I'm very, very happy to have now the reconnect this sense about national park, because um, I think we could be proud 
because we have uh, we we could be proud with our territories because we have re richness biodiversity some levers uh, the place on the ecosystem about association we are few many many associations and uh, many networks local networks we work together we I, uh, it, we have a very well preserved territory uh, we have a story a long story about local development and uh, we have not bad support about state and region, uh, so it's not too bad in this point. And last things, I want to say it's very important to don't be alone just in our territories, but to have partnership networks. So just uh, one word about uh, RTOS, uh, National Networks about Social Economy, because I am vice president, and, uh, but because Sincerely, I think this network is very important because it's important to have the experience of the other, and not only in France, but in Europe level. It's why I'm very happy to have make, uh, the occasion to make this presentation uh, because uh, we have to think we are not alone to have the same problem. We have to go to the good economy. We have to think um, uh, Many, many rural areas have the same problem, and we will be strong, more strong, of, if, of course, if we will be unified to defend this problematic. Uh, so it's very important to be in networks. So just I quote the, the RTOS, these networks, because I know very well, and because these networks make a very good job to give us some experiences, to, be, to give us some context, to improve our practice, to go near best practices. But uh, it's not the only example. Uh, and sometimes it's not the good uh, place. Good. We have no uh, reflex to look the experience of the other. So we have to improve this. So um, it's all what uh, it was, uh, what uh, I would like to say about our experience to go to the good economy. I hope uh, it's a good, uh, a good experience for you and good explanation for you. And maybe you have some question. And really thank you for the invitation and to uh, the listening. I stop to share my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, so, uh, do you have any questions from the audience? For her? Maybe one uh, question you can uh, uh, share uh, with us. What uh, RTS is providing uh, okay. to to local authorities that are uh, uh, your member yeah of course um, RTS uh, provide uh, different uh, results for example it give us for example we want we would like to improve our practice with public procurement about uh, child services we have some keep garden or garden uh, for child child garden sorry and uh, we would like to change our practices in this subject. We asked to RTS if they, have, if they know some other experience to help us to go maybe very near a cooperative. And they give us uh, more contact uh, for, with good practices. It's the first uh, help. And other thing is that the RTS organize a um, conference, webinar, and what um, is a specificity of a uh, uh, webinar about uh, subject who are important for us. For example, about urbanistic scheme, for example, about public procurement, and every, uh, uh, of course, about the place of social economy, because the RTS, the RTS is a network about social economy. So when we organize a webinar about the public procurement. The question is what the place of social economy, how to improve the place of social economic in public procurement. 
on the organize something like that, very regular uh, conference. And this conference or webinar are open uh, to the elective people and to the technical people. And it's very important, in my opinion, to cross point of view between different uh, elective people. For example, elective people who come from small communities like me, or with elective people who come from urban. But it's very important too to cross elective people on technical, uh, because maybe sometimes we don't see really the difficult. Another example, now next Friday, RTS organized a webinar about uh, local food, because in France now there is a, because there is a big plan uh, organized by the government about local food on place of uh, local food in public procurement. So RTS organized um, a webinar about, and we could have some other example. And it's very, very important to convince some of the, my colleagues, some of the elective people to have example in other territories, because if not, they could see just my, uh, my idea, my opinion, or, and if they say oh, the territory do that and they succeed, they succeed in, it's very, it's a good thing. And of course, the last things of RTS is to defend some uh, law, some point in law, some reg regulation at the national level with the ministry. We, we have in France now a social uh, a secret, a secretary state about social economy. So it's very important to discuss with them to understand uh, on to the problematic of social economy in the rural area, for example, or about different subjects. So it's very, very important for us to have this uh, uh, link and at the European level too, because uh, so the RTOS is, is at the uh, European level too. So it's very important to explain the place of local community at the European. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one question from uh, people that are listening uh, us on online stream. Uh, I guess uh, uh, it was uh, clear from your uh, presentation from the map where RTS uh, is active, but there is a question if you are active in central uh, Brittany and maybe in which uh, cities or territories. So in central, um, if, I, if we are active in central Brittany? Yes. Yes. Yes, um, I th if I understand well the question, the last uh, slide show, and if you go on the website, I can sh give you the address uh, on website, uh, on uh, chat. Uh, you have uh, all place where RTS is active. And uh, yes, the, the Brittany region is uh, very active, is active in uh, RTS. And uh, yes, is it a question or I don't understand? Yes, we have another question. Just please wait. Uh, hello. My hello. name is my name is Marco. Uh, I, uh, I work in the Association of Cities in, in Croatia. Um, I'm interesting uh, interested to uh, to hear from you how important uh, or how useful is a local action group as a tool for promoting uh, and for coordinating and organizing uh, activities related to, to social and uh, uh, solidarity economy. Yes, you speak about the local action group of leaders, the, the European program. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 of course. It's very, very important because our territory in the place where I live, there is a leader program since maybe 20 years old now. And uh, if we have not leader, all I speak about, it doesn't exist. It's leader who really set up um, local, local development uh, spirit, local development practices. Uh, it would, uh, leader give us um, um, to ex help us to think with the local project not just a school or a child or elderly in very separate uh, uh, distinction. To, uh, what I think is very important to have a local, local territories project and to think 
things are linked. And I think it's the main fact to think about transition, about the climate change transition, about digital transition, about economic transition, to go to the good economy. We have to think with a local, local project, local development project. And if we have not leaders since 20 years old, we have not these uh, habits, we have not so many technicians, and uh, it gives us kind of culture for elective people who are now in place. So it's very, very important. And you know, in France, we have a new generation state contracts just in six months. We call that a CRTE, Contrat de Relance et Transition Ecologique, uh, relance, relance, sorry, relance and Transition uh, Local Contract. And now we have this contract, this kind of contract in all places of France. And the, the state, for the first time, the state said us, we, we will give you money with, if you have a local project, I am simplify a little because it's more complex in reality, but it's a new spirit. It's very important. And in my point of view, these things exist because we have the story like a, a local action group in our place, of course. And other point is very important. I just say in my presentation, we have a, about environmental, we have a civil report just uh, six months or maybe less. And, uh, and for the first time, the elective people, than me or my colleague, listen very carefully the recommendation of this report. And this report comes from the civil society. And the civil society come from, we have a civil society group, but this culture and this possibility come from because we have leaders on our territories. So I don't know if I answer your question, but for us it's very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, some, another, some another question. Uh, maybe Patricia, for for uh, for final question, you can answer. Uh, since we are uh, basically teaching here in Croatia about social and solidarity economy, especially on on the level of public policies. Uh, what is your opinion of uh, maybe in France, if you have a municipality where there is no tradition or experience in this topic, what is your uh, suggestion uh, as a first steps, what to do, how to approach with this concept uh, when you are coming to some, let's say, new, new, new area, new territory? <laughs> It's a very big and very important question. It's why I think, because I know I am elective people in a 300, basically, my uh, community is the 350 people, just that. And I know we are not, I am not elective in a community uh, with a lot of asking about transition. So I know what's the problem. And um, it's why I think it's very important to have a framework of legal a uh, legal framework at the national state, because if the law say you have to go in this direction to have subsidies, uh, I think it's a main uh, condition to change things. But uh, to answer better to your question, I think it's very important to not, not to want to go change everything in the same time, and maybe not to want to have a big, big project, but you have to coach the, uh, a subject. For example, in my localities, um, we, we have a, a building, uh, we have to rebuild because in, histor in small historic, historical buildings, and I know um, each people of the village uh, have an attachment with this building. So we make a local uh, group, and we, uh, we will be uh, um, we will be have sustain uh, to help us in the democracy local to go. And uh, because I know each people want this building go on, and uh, don't want we destroy this building, and we could have a reflection about how this building could be a transition way. How could how we could rebuild this building with a passive method, or passive energetic method. And, and I think my, maybe my concern is to have a, a very local problem 
and if we to um, to put to other people on to ask what we could do and and after with this first step it's possible to go to the like for example or to coach uh, I don't know what's about in Croatia, but to coach uh, maybe some laws, some regulations, some subsidies with a relaunch plan, for example, from Europe or something like that, and to coach things. But we have to, would like to answer a local problem and don't want just to have a terroric project. I don't know if you understand what I want to explain you, but maybe I think it's more important. Okay. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, now we will continue with our conference with uh, another keynote speaker. Thank you very much for joining Thank us you. and for your time and uh, really good uh, presentation of your community and uh, work of uh, RTS. Thank you. Thank you much for your invitation. Thanks and take care. Uh, okay, sada ćemo nastaviti sa pričom koja je bliska ovoj, koja se dotiče iskustva jednog našeg laga. Radi se o lagu Laura sa sjedištem u Biogradu na moru koji pokriva susjedne općine, pokriva otoke, priobalje i zaleđe. S nama je Ivan Čupić koji je stručni suradnik i laga, ali i stručni suradnik grada Biograd na moru, koji stoji za mnogih od tih projekata. Pa će nam Ivan Čupić predstaviti na koji način oni stvaraju lokalni održivi razvoj za povećanje kvalitete života lokalnog stanovništva. Ivane, da li se čujemo? Dobar dan, čujemo se. Evo sad još samo i da se vidimo i onda bi to bilo super. Evo. Malo. I da dignemo prezentaciju. Da li vidite prezentaciju? Evo, javljaju mi da će uskoro biti vidljiva. Vidimo. Vidimo prezentaciju, vidimo mene. Samo malo. Još da full screen stavimo. I to je to. Možemo, krenimo. Hvala lijepa. Dobar dan svim sudionicima. Čestitam i zahvaljujem organizatorima na ovako dobroj organiziranoj konferenciji. Pozdravljam sve i partnere na ovoj konferenciji, pozdravljam predstavnike udruga gradova, pozdravljam i sve kolege paneliste ili predavače kako god se zvali i evo da krenemo, danas ćemo vam predstaviti malo projekata iz grada Biograda na moru, evo dopala me ta čast da predstavim projekte. Možda samo nekoliko riječi uvodnih za one koji ne znaju gdje je grad Biograd. Grad Biograd volimo reći da je u srcu Jadrana, u srcu Jadranske obale, tako i brendiramo sami grad. Pošto sam bio i deset godina voditelj laga, još i uvijek sam uključen aktivno, tako da ćemo malo pričati o lagu koji je specifičan lag koji pokriva i priobalje i zaleđe, ruralni naravno dio, i obale i otoke naše predivne, tako da evo obuhvaćamo i otok ljubavi, onaj otokčić u obliku srca. Par podataka u vezi grada Biograda. Vidio sam na prvoj prezentaciji je bio jedan zanimljiv podatak kako su imali porast broja noćenja sa 400 tisuća na 1,2 miliona. Ista stvar identična se dogodila i u Biogradu. U posljednjih nekoliko godina imamo na dosta strana pokazatelje u plusu. A među ostalim je tako i broj noćenja, i broj posjetitelja, i broj turista je konstantno u porastu. Naravno, ako izuzmemo ovu trenutnu situaciju, do sada je uvijek bio pozitivan. Zatim imamo pozitivan i prirast nataliteta, jedan od devet gradova u Hrvatskoj gdje je pozitivan prirast. Nezaposlenost je jako mala i minimalna i evo toliko o Biogradu, 5600 stanovnika ima sami grad, nemamo okolnih naselja, isključivo se, odnosno isključivo većinom se bave ljudi turizmom direktno ili indirektno 
a, sa turizmom, svim oblicima turizma, a gdje je, možemo reći, jedan od najzanimljivijih je nautički turizam, a onda i svi ostali oblici turizma. Uz to imamo naravno i poljoprivredu koja je a, vezana za ravne kotare koji su u zaleđu i toliko o tome. Idemo sada proći, danas smo izabrali... A, desetak, petnaest najzanimljivijih projekata evo, na kojima se spajaju, na dosta njih se spajaju javni, civilni i privatni sektor, to je ono što je zanimljivo i gdje, ajmo reći, mi imamo nekakvu ulogu u svemu tome. Pa krenimo. Znači, naš Lag Laura, kao što smo i rekli, jedan od, pilot, od tri pilot projekta u Hrvatskoj koji su osnovani još 2009. godine, pa eto imamo nešto iskustva iza sebe. U zadnjem razdoblju smo na osnovu strategije razvojne dobili odobrenje na 13 miliona kuna. Od toga smo naravno podijelili na mlade poljoprivrednike, male poljoprivrednike i poboljšanje infrastrukture lokalne. I evo, za sada su svi natječaji dobro odrađeni i sada se onaj, obrađuju još do kraja. Flag Lostura... Ista priča, identična za ribarstvo. Tu nam je područje, znači što se tiče laga, nam je područje dva grada. Biograd Benkovac i 11 okolnih općina kod flaga, odnosno laga u ribarstvu. Tu je smo nešto manji, jedan grad i četiri, loka, i četiri općine okolne. Tu smo imali na raspolaganju 16 miliona kuna i onaj, već smo nekoliko natječaja raspisali i onaj, nekoliko u pripremi. Evo, nadamo se do kraja onaj, razdoblja da ćemo sve iskoristiti. Odnosno, ostali smo onaj, još samo sa jednim natječajem vani, drugo je sve riješeno. Idemo dalje. Ovo je a, jedan od zanimljivih projekata. Gdje su, gdje su uključeni, možemo reći, svi sektori koje imamo na raspolaganju. Sam vlasnik ovog objekta je grad Biograd, ali nositelj projekta je Park prirode Vransko jezero, a partner je onda ušao grad Biograd i klaster za ekodruštvene inovacije i razvoj Cedra i Splita, kao i HGSS, odnosno Hrvatska gorska služba spašavanja. Projekt je jako zanimljiv po tome što je zamišljen na način da tri nacionalna parka i tri parka prirode u našem okruženju, kao što smo rekli na početku, grad Biograd se nalazi u srcu Jadrana, ne samo geografski po položaju, nego i kad pogledamo i nacionalne parkove i parkove prirode, evo imamo tu sreću što se nalazimo u sredini, i ovo je naime jedan projekt koji će obuhvatiti, objediniti sve parkove i onaj na temu aktivnog turizma. Naime, cijela zgrada je koncipirana u šest dijelova i s tim da svaki park, odnosno park prirode, dobije jedan svoj dio na temu aktivnog turizma, pa ćete tako imati priliku ući u jedan nacionalni park, voziti bicikle sa VR naočalama i ostalom tehnologijom, zatim u drugi park pa ćete moći uzeti kajak, pa ćete veslati, u treći ćete imati umjetnu stijenu za penjanje i tako dalje da ne nabrajam. Znači, ukupna vrijednost projekta je nešto više od 20 miliona kuna, a odobreno je nešto malo manje od 13 miliona kuna iz OPKK, naravno. I evo sada je o, taj projekt u realizaciji, ovo je trenutna slika njega i nadamo se do kraja godine da će projekt biti e, završen. Idemo dalje. Ovo je jedan a, a, projekt također koji je rađen u suradnji nekoliko partnera. Isto je bila priča, evo na ova dva se poklopilo da je javna ustanova Park prirode Vransko jezero bila nositelj cijele priče jer je bio natječaj za prirodnu baštinu. Kao što znate, Vransko jezero je najveće jezero u Hrvata, nalazi se odmah u našem zaleđu Biograda. A onda su se tu opet spojili i nadovezali partneri, grad Biograd, pošto je on vlasnik samog objekta bio, 
zatim udruga BIOM i LAG Laura kao partneri. Naime, ovdje se radi isto jednom, zaboravio sam reći, na prošlom objektu, objekt je pod konzervatorskom zaštitom, a onda svi koji se bave projektima znaju koliko to još dodatno komplicira stvar. Tako je bila priča i sa ovim objektom, također je bio pod zaštitom konzervatora, također je rađena rekonstrukcija, po svim, naravno, pravilima, zadanim i ujetima. I evo ovaj, ovaj objekt je sada trenutno u funkciji, on je završen prošle godine, a to je bio samo jedan dio a, velikog jednog projekta, također vrijednosti nešto manje od 30 miliona kuna, gdje, u sklopu kojeg je Vransko jezero još radilo cijeli niz aktivnosti na samom jezeru, a onda uz to je napravljen ovaj, odnosno rekonstruiran ovaj objekt koji će biti u svrhu turisti info centra za Vransko jezero, a ujedno i za grad Biograd na moru. Moramo reći da su ovdje još se nadovezuju razne, razne i drugi manji projekti u budućnosti koji će spajati i lokalne poljoprivrednike još. Znači, to je bila uloga LAGA da spoji, osim što spaja ove sve partnere do sada, da spaja i u budućnosti i lokalne OPG-ovce koji će imati priliku prodavati svoje proizvode putem ovih turist info centara. Tako i onaj prvi projekt, unutar prvog projekta je zamišljeno čak i jedna mala kušaonica, odnosno degustacijska prostorija u podrumu, a ovdje je zamišljeno, planira se da jednog dana budu vjerovat ispred nekakva prodajna mala mjesta, odnosno i unutra će se svi OPG-ovci na našem području imati priliku reklamirati, odnosno prezentirati svoje proizvode. Idemo dalje. Ovo je ljetno kino, također projekt, odnosno ovaj nije odobren iz EU, ovo se radi vlastitim sredstvima, radi se o rekonstrukciji postojećeg objekta, ulaže se 6 miliona kuna, jedna, jedna zanimljiva ljetna pozornica koja se radila 1975. i naravno sada je potrebna rekonstrukcija. Ovaj objekt će biti završen kroz narednih 20 dana, a služit će za apsolutno sve, za održavanje kulturnih manifestacija, za kulturna umjetnička društva, naravno i za kino, projekcije, za koncerte i apsolutno sve moguće događaje. I evo sada se to pokazalo čak i jako dobro u ovoj situaciji pandemije. Svi vole biti na otvorenome, odnosno tako nam i mjere nalažu i sve ostalo. Tako da evo nadamo se da ćemo ovo ljeto barem moći u nekom obliku organizirati i ovdje neke događaje. Idemo dalje. Naravno da digitalna i zelena tehnologija i svi volimo nešto pametno, pa tako smo i mi u gradu Biogradu niz cijeli jednih manjih projekata odradili koji se mogu svrstati u ovu kategoriju pametnog digitalnog zelenog kako god. Pa evo tu imamo već od prije možda deset godina i električnu punionicu automobila, Inače, grad i koristi automobile na struju, bicikle na struju za svoje djelatnike i sve ostalo. Pa evo imamo i nekoliko klupa, za pametnih takozvanih klupa za punjenje naravno. Zatim iskoristili smo i evropski natječaj Wi-Fi for EU, gdje smo isto dobili tih 15.000 eura za besplatni internet po gradu. I što se tiče štedne vanjske rasvijete, tu se konstantno ulaže. Naime, preskupa je opcija, mislim najbolja je opcija da se cijeli grad zamijeni sa štednom, ali je to preskupa opcija i uz sufinanciranje fonda koji e, omogućuje do 40%, ona ipak to ispadne skupa, pa se ide dio po dio grada, svake godine se mijenja dio e, žarulja, naravno u štedne žarulje. Idemo dalje. Ovo je jedan od, e, možemo reći, e, najboljih, projekata koji su se dogodili u zadnje vrijeme kod nas i evo u njemu upravo imamo i svoje urede i to nam je sada, ajmo reći, novi izazov staviti ovaj objekt u funkciju, a on je znači poduzetnički inkubator Biograd. Investicija je bila oko 35 miliona kuna, od toga 20 miliona kuna se sufinancira iz EU sredstava naravno, a nositelj projekta je grad, a partneri su 
poduzetnički inkubator Biograd DO, poduzetnički inkubator BIOS DO iz Osijeka. Oni su nam naravno cijelo vrijeme partneri kao i Cedra Split i JDO. Uz navedene imamo još cijeli niz vanjskih suradnika na projektu u stosu i razvojne agencije i OPG-ovci koji indirektno će sudjelovati u ovoj priči, zatim neke druge susjedne općine i tako. Ajmo samo ukratko kako smo mi to zamislili. Vidite svi na slici kako to izgleda. Dolje je devet proizvodnih hala, gore je sedamnaest ureda. Naravno, ide sve po sistemu inkubatora. Prvih pet godina, znači nakon pet godina izlazite van. Prednost pri useljenju imaju mlade firme, odnosno ispod tri godine. Ako nema takvih, onda idu i firme i obrti iznad tri godine. Evo možemo reći da pet mjeseci je prošlo od otvorenja ovog objekta i iako smo se bojali zbog trenutne situacije, hoće li zaživjeti, hoće li ovo sve imati smisla, pokazalo se i jako, jako dobro. U pet mjeseci smo ga napunili kompletno. Znači već imamo i listu čekanja za nevjerovati, jer uvijek morate i uzeti u obzir sve ovo što govorim, pričamo o jednom maloj, maloj sredini, grad Biograd 5600 stanovnika, to je jedna malo veća zgrada Mamutica u Zagrebu, i okolne općine svaka po nekoliko tisuća stanovnika. I evo iz ovog bazena, pod navodnike, smo onaj, pokupili sve što god se moglo. Sada trenutno u gore uredima imamo raznih a, djelatnosti, od arhitekata, webovaca, IT-evaca, čartera, svega, a dolje u halama, što nas najviše veseli, kreće dosta proizvodnje. Od proizvodnje sladoleda, proizvodnje pelata od paradajza, proizvodnja sokova, proizvodnja namještaja, apsolutno jedno šaroliko društvo. Namjerno nismo planirali inkubator samo za određene djelatnosti, jer ne možemo se to priguštiti u maloj sredini, nego smo ga jednostavno otvorili za sve moguće djelatnosti. S tim da, sa jednom halom, nju smo pod navodnike rezervirali i u njoj razvijamo jednu posebnu priču. Razvijamo nešto inovativno, barem inovativno je kod nas u ovom dijelu Hrvatske. Opremit ćemo jedan multifunkcionalni pogon za preradu hrane i pića. Što to znači u prevodu? Mi na našem području Laga, Flaga i, sve, i cijele Županije imamo jako veliki broj, ja ih zovem pod navodnike mini OPG-ova, mini poljoprivrednih gospodarstava, koji, doma, koji u svojim kućama za sada prerađuju hobistički svoje proizvode poljoprivredne u džemove, marmelade, ajvare i ostalo, a mi ćemo im ovdje dati priliku da oni na dnevnoj bazi i satnoj bazi iznajmljivaju taj prostor koji će imati četiri proizvodne linije. Linija za preradu džemova, marmelada, ajvara i slično, sušara, voća i povrća, zatim linija za energetske pločice i e, linija za češnjak. Kako će to izgledati? To će izgledati tako da mali OPG-ovac koji nema ni financijskih ni ljudskih mogućnosti onaj doma na tom svom imanju a, raditi svoj pogon za preradu, a i nema smisla da njih 30-40 radi svak svoj pogon, oni će imati zajednički pogon na korištenje. Kada dođe sa svojih 100 kila smokava, dođe preradi ih dva dana i znajmi prostor i ide doma. Odnosno, već na katu razvijamo drugi projekt sa razvojnom agencijom, sa Agrom. Razvijamo jedan mali fotostudio gdje će oni moći te proizvode koji proizvedu dolje u prizemlju gore uslikati, zatim i dizajnirati, odnosno naši ljudi će im napraviti dizajn etikete, odnosno prijedloge za etikete i čak idemo na to da se nabavi i etiketirka koja će im odmah isprintati, barem prvu seriju da im isprintamo etikete. Što znači da kada prođe cijeli ovaj proces, mali OPG-ovac je spreman za tržište. 
E sada, što se tiče tržišta, tu imamo u planu čak jednog dana i otvaranje zajedničke trgovine tih proizvoda, pa čak smo dali zaštititi jedan znak koji smo dobili zaštitu žiga, Dalmatian Quality, onaj po uzoru na, na lika quality i ostale slične onaj u Hrvatskoj i danas sutra ćemo im otvarati nekakve i kanale prodaje naravno u turizmu a posebno ćemo probati doći i do naših čartera i svih ostalih onaj uz ovu trgovinu kojeg jed, koju jednog dana budemo imali onaj probat ćemo i otvoriti i sve moguće ostale kanale evo toliko o ovom objektu Naravno, na kraju prezentacije sam otvoren i slobodan za sva moguća pitanja. Idemo dalje. Ovo je jedan muzej ribarstva koji grad planira, muzej ribarske opreme. Inače, Biograd je treće iskrcajno mjesto u Hrvatskoj za ribu. Znate i svi sami, ovdje su i, i one, u našoj blizini ribogojilišta i uzgoj tune, uzgoj brancina i sve ostale ribe. A što se tiče izlova, imamo veliko iskrcajno mjesto, pa tako da grad planira i nekakve projekte u ribarstvu. Ovo je naša industrijska zona koja je potpuno onaj, puna i konstantno se traže novi zahtjevi, tako da se uvijek i rade planovi za infrastrukture. Infrastrukture nikad dosta, to onaj, svi znamo, ali evo, uvijek ima smisla ulagati u ovakve projekte, tako da evo, planira se proširenje i dokumentacija već spremna isto za nova ulaganja i nove natječaje. Ovo je jedan a, projekt koji je opet u suradnji sa Hrvatskim crvenim križom, odnosno gradskim društvom i gradom gdje se radi a, dnevni boravak za starije osobe. Projekt je odobren, ukupna vrijednost je nešto ispod 14 miliona kuna. O, ovo je otpad. E, ovo su ih zanima. I možemo reći da evo u Biogradu, ha, malo će ispati da se hvalim, ali što ću ja, ona, imamo svoje prednosti i nedostatke. Što se tiče otpada, dosta se napravilo, naravno svi, cijela Hrvatska je još daleko od uh, kraja priče, ali evo možemo reći da se pomalo počeo zatvarati krug, kako ga ja zovem, pa smo prvo nabavili kante, odnosno Biograd već godinama, Razdvaja, imamo doma već tri kante različite, odnosno imamo zelenu, plavu i žutu vrećicu, a evo sada dolaze i smeđe, pa smo tako riješili problem sa kantama, pa smo evo dobili još jedno dodatno vozilo za razvrstani otpad. Također je odobren projekt realiziran, sada je u realizaciji, pa smo napravili reciklažno dvorište, nešto više od 5 miliona kuna također iz EU fondova. Uz reciklažno se radi pretovarna stanica, to radi županijska tvrtka, Eko DOO, naravno grad je partner, zatim sortirnica otpada, napravljena je dokumentacija, čekamo natječaj i onda ona je završna je sanacija odlagališta, također je napravljena dokumentacija, čekamo natječaj i finale ove cijele priče će biti kada se napravi županijski regionalni centar za odvajanje otpada, onaj, a evo možemo reći da nadamo se barem da će u narednih nekoliko godina, jer evo i njihova priča je krenula, onaj, počeli su radovi što nas veseli i evo nadamo se onda u narednih nekoliko godina da će se ovaj cijeli krug sa otpadom zatvoriti, a to svi znamo koliki je to ogroman problem, ali evo barem na vidiku je možda onaj kraj. Idemo dalje. Uz to još u gradu je nekoliko zanimljivih manjih projekata, pa je tako planira se cijela tržnica onaj, rekonstruirati, odnosno srušiti stari dio i napraviti. Tako ista priča i sa ribarnicom, planira se srušiti, napraviti novi dio. Autobusni kolodvor isto također. Ovo sve što govorim, sve u nekoj fazi od dokumentacije. Trajektna luka isto ide van grada, tako i ribarska luka, jer dolazi do zagađenja, odnosno velikog problema sa prometom i onaj to mora jednog dana evo, ići van grada. Evo ovo je ta ribarsko, ribarsko iskrcano mjesto, točnije se naziva i to je rekonstruirano prije tri godine. 
Evo vidite da ovdje su jedna od najvećih plivarica u državi, onaj koje ovdje imaju i sjedište, a i ovdje vrše redovni iskrca i ribe, tako da je bilo neophodno to sve i obnoviti. Uređenje plaža, evo svi se nadamo najboljem, stalno neko pita kakva će biti sezona, mi se pravimo koda je sve u redu i koda će biti najbolja. Evo veseli me, danas smo tamo dobili nekakve informacije da već od sljedećeg tjedna turisti neki dolaze autobusima, što znači da će valjda priča ova krenuti, da nismo uzalud onaj sređivali plaže, uložilo se opet jako dosta i u njih, redovno se sređivaju zidovi, ograde, pošumljava se i sve ostalo što je nužno. Ovo se financira naime vlastitim sredstvima, nije bilo nekakvih natječaja za to. I naravno za naše najmlađe konstantno je uređenje dječjih igrališta, mislim da je ovo zadnja brojka od ove godine, tako da je malo se i to popravilo, jer kao što smo i rekli, imamo tu sreću da imamo više rođenih nego umrlih, što nas veseli, tako da nije uzalo sve ovo što radimo. I evo s ovim ja polako privodim svoju prezentaciju kraju i nadam se da nisam bio dosadan i ostavljam naravno prostor taman pet minuta, ako se ne varam, za bilo kakva pitanja, ali evo možemo i produžiti koliko god treba. Hvala na pažnji. Hvala puno. Evo, otvaramo prostor za pitanja i diskusiju. Čuli smo dosta zanimljivu priču iz Biograda i iz okolice, na koji način se ove sve teme koje smo mi spominjali nekako spajaju pa i podržavaju kroz brojna ulaganja i projekte. Imate li pitanja? Možda, Ivane, da nam isto malo pojasnite na koji način se donose odluke da se ide u određene projekte i na koji način ih nekako stavljate u neki ukupan razvoj grada i okolice? Naravno, službeno postoji, kao i svugdje, strategija razvoja grada, ali svi znamo da najčešće te strategije koje se rade i planiraju, one završe u ladicama, najčešće. Naravno, jedan dio se toga uvijek iskoristi, ali moramo reći da evo, snalazimo se i moram priznati otvoreno, najčešće se i prilagođavamo natječajima, jer svi znamo, svi smo ograničeni sredstvima, i lag, i Vransko jezero, park prirode, i grad, i Crveni križ, i vidite sada svi mogući subjekti, a pogotovo da ne pričamo o udrugama koji imaju male budžete, i jednostavno kada se otvori neki natječaj, a imamo jako veliku bazu spremnih projekata, mi u svakom trenutku imamo oko 30 spremnih projekata razno raznih u kulturnom dijelu, u kulturnom, poslovnom sektoru, turizmu, u čemu god, civilnom sektoru, uvijek imamo nekakvu bazu u rezervnu projekata, uvijek ima projekata koji su spremni i sa dokumentacijom, neki su naravno u fazi idejnog projekta, neki u glavnom, neki imaju ishodovane sve dozvole i jednostavno kako se otvori koji natječaj, tako posložimo partnerstvo, Evo, imamo stvarno sreću da apsolutno svi subjekti koje smo ovdje naveli i ostali kojih još nema, ovo je samo jedan dio projekata, apsolutno imamo super suradnju od grada, turističke zajednice, muzeja, Vranskog jezera, ostalih naših partnera od Splita, Zagreba, Zadra. Apsolutno svugdje imamo razumijevanje i jednostavno sjedamo svi za stol, odlučuje se jako brzo, brzo se donose odluke, Naravno, tu uvijek postoji formalnost od gradonačelnika, gradskog vijeća pa na dolje, tako i u ostalim institucijama od ravnatelja prema dolje. Svi se stjedaju za stol, ovi najbitniji donose odluku, da li se ide u projekt, tako da, ide se i to je to. Evo, moramo reći da u zadnjih deset godina do sada nismo imali većih problema sa nijednim od partnera. Zato je posložila se jedna dobra ekipa, i evo vide se nekakvi rezultati, naravno uvijek to može biti bolje, ali evo vide se rezultati, za sada to dobro ide. 
Super, hvala. Evo još jedno pitanje imamo. Imali smo, čuli smo danas i neke primjere iz inozemstva vezano za ovisnost o turizmu i korištenje možda nekih održivih oblika i dugoročnih oblika turizma. Imali smo i ranije na konferenciji primjer iz stresa. Sad iz ovog što ste vi prezentirali, Biograd izgleda dosta zapravo poduzetničko proizvodna zona, pa možda da podijelite s nama koliko koliko zapravo je važan taj udio turizma, kako balansirate zapravo da ova kriza koja se dogodila u sektoru ne utječe toliko jako na svakodnevan život i na kvalitetu života? Da, jako dobro pitanje. Naravno, svi sada razmišljamo još više u drugim pravcima. Nije svako zlo za zlo. Počeli su i svi ostali razmišljati u drugim pravcima. Što se tiče turizma, vidite i sami da uvijek mi razmišljamo i o ovom ruralnom turizmu naravno i o Vranskom jezeru i o svim mogućim mogućnostima koje nudi Vransko jezero, koje nude ravni kotari. Onda na drugu stranu nama je dobro što je jak nautički turizam. Što to znači u prevodu? Nije to samo oni ljetni sezonski mjeseci, nego to znači da u industrijskoj zoni imamo takozvane suhe marine, gdje se naravno izlače brodovi koji su jako naravno skupi i onda na njima se pokreću još ostale djelatnosti uz servis motora, uz stolariju, plastiku, inox, apsolutno sve ostale djelatnosti koje su indirektno vezane na to. A onda treća strana priče je ova koju pokrećemo i sa samim inkubatorom uz sve djelatnosti kojima smo otvorili inkubator, pa smo spomenuli i nešto malo imamo mi IT-evaca, web-ovaca, arhitekata i svih djelatnosti, e pokrećemo još u prizemlju i tu priču sa poljoprivredom. Naime, imamo sreću da je naše zaleđe jako plodno i krećemo sa tom preradom sada u nekoliko smjerova kako i mi izgledamo pokrećemo kroz projekte to, tako i ostali korisnici, što smo rekli, pokreću i od proizvodnje sokova i pelata, od pomidora, odnosno paradajza, tako i mi, nadamo se, barem 30 OPG-ovaca uči u ovu našu priču proizvodnje i očekujemo jednog dana da imamo barem do 100 proizvoda nekakvih kojih možemo ponuditi na tržištu. Što znači opet spajanje svih mogućih, opet spajanje sva tri sektora, javnog, privatnog i civilnog sektora, spajamo svih sa svime, ulazimo u trgovinu, inače pokrenuli smo i onu web pijacu, onaj ko nije još do sad nekaj, zapratite nas, gdje se dosta i prodaje poljoprivrednih i prerađenih proizvoda, tako da, da u nekoliko pravaca djelujemo, pa eto, negdje onda možda i uspijemo. Evo, hvala puno. Mi nastavljamo dalje s konferencijom. Hvala puno na uključenju i nadam se da se uskoro i vidimo u živo i možda i pozitivimo i vidimo u živo. Hvala i vama, evo pozivam, pozivam sve sudionike da dođete u Biograd, evo bit ćete gosti na, našeg inkubatora. Pozdrav. Hvala i pozdrav, držite se. Uh, ok, uh, sad imamo našu zadnju danas gošću iz, uh, iz Evrope. <clears throat> Lynn Collins. Lynn je zapravo dolazi iz sindikalnog pokreta, ali nam je danas zanimljiva zato što ona savjetnica za strateške odnose i suradnju cijele regije oko grada Liverpoola u Velikoj Britaniji, koji pokriva i manje gradove oko najvećeg grada. Isto jedna zanimljiva priča, ona će se posebno osvrnuti kako su sve reagirali da ova utjecaj COVID-19 krize, na koji način su zapravo koristili društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju kao lijek na ovu krizu. Da li nam se Lynn spojila? Lynn, can you hear us? I can, I hope you can hear me too. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I made a short introduction about you, but you are free to 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 start uh, as 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 you wanted, as you wish. Uh, thank you for joining us because of your tight uh, schedule, and uh, welcome. And the floor is yours. 
Thank you. And I think I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So let's hope this works. Yes, we can see it. Okay. There we go. So uh, many thanks for the invitation to join you today. And can I begin by sending solidarity to you all in these difficult times when our human instincts are to physically be together to support our communities, but they've been replaced by these virtual chances to share and support. A little about me to begin with. I've just finished a secondment to the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority from the Trade Union Congress, our National Trade Union Centre, where my role is to head up our Northwest office. I'm also a mayoral advisor to the Metro Mayor, Steve Rotherham, focusing on fairness and equalities. And on the secondment, I was focused on delivering work for the Metro Mayor's Fair Employment Charter, local industrial strategy, and establishing an action group to tackle poverty. The third area of work was to build collaboration and relations with the social and solidarity economy. And then COVID came along. And the next two slides will indicate the impact that this had on our economy. So here you can see uh, the on the left, the areas, uh, the impact on our economy from April 2020. And on the right, the impact on the number of people claiming state benefits. So out of work uh, or in need of their low pay being topped up. And on this slide, uh, on the left, it shows our city region with the areas of highest deprivation most darkly covered. And on the right, it shows the impact of the pandemic on those claiming benefits has grown most in those areas. So the poor are getting much Poorer. And as the UK went into three periods of lockdown, our social and solidarity economy, far from locking down, stepped up to the front line. We saw the sector respond with socially trading businesses pivoting what they could, were doing to both survive as a business and to deliver support directly to our communities. New food delivery services, cycle repair and refurbishment projects, and maker spaces switching from producing fashion items to producing personal protective equipment to distribute to care homes and to our national health service. And for our community and voluntary organisations, they immediately stepped up to deliver frontline services. Existing organisations who were used to opening their doors to communities had to rethink how they delivered their services. So youth centres, making up packs of essential toiletries for delivery to their young people domestic abuse support services, preparing for the consequences of the government's stay at home message, and organisations supporting our black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, dealing with the disproportionately high death rate on top of existing layers of disadvantage and social exclusion. I wanted to highlight just a few of the problems that emerged and how the sectors responded. And these won't be unique to Liverpool, and many of you will be familiar with them. So firstly, Liverpool's city region has a very high proportion of residents 
for whom the medical advice was for them to shield at home. They'll be people with long-standing medical conditions linked to poverty and disadvantage. This meant they had to stay at home and not leave for any other reason. This created a massive new demand for support with obtaining food, medication, as well as creating new levels of isolation and anxiety amongst that group of our population. Secondly, we already had the scandal of the world's sixth richest country having whole communities reliant on the support from food banks for their survival. If you add almost 40,000 new claimants for state benefit in April 2020 alone, all of whom would have to wait because of our system five weeks to receive their first payment, then the pressure on the charities in that part of the se sector was immense. Thirdly, we knew that before COVID, that many of our disadvantaged communities were digitally excluded with a lack of both physical kit and connectivity. So while the city region generally has good coverage for super fast broadband, the take up of this is low in the most disadvantaged communities. And with the move to homeschooling, mostly based online, left families with limited kit and no connectivity at a massive disadvantage. We've heard anecdotally of large families with three or four children, all sharing one smartphone and a data limit to try to access online schooling. And that went on for months and months throughout the pandemic. And finally, while much of the focus of the impact of COVID has been on our older generations, it's become clear that the long-term impact on young people will be huge. Already, apprenticeship opportunities have almost dried up for those leaving school this summer. We know that a move to teachers predicting exam grades rather than students sitting exams will impact directly on the most disadvantaged children. And that's not to mention the impact on being locked in with your parents for long periods of time without seeing friends or the normal support networks that you have. So the mental health impact on young people will be massive. So what have we done to support the social and solidarity economy during this crisis here in Liverpool city region? Firstly, it's required much more engagement and collaborative working and also some direct interventions. Our Metro Mayor had already in place a range of panels and groups to do this, but the development of others was speeded up. The Fairness and Social Justice Advisory Board, which I chair, increased its meetings and the new Social and Solidarity Economy Reference Panel started to meet, providing a business voice for the sector. Also, the Metro Mayor's Young People's Advisory Group began to meet to advise the Mayor on the impact of young people. And work continued on the Fair Employment Charter, aimed at getting employers to sign up to decent conditions at work in the city region. This was launched in February, alongside the general promotion of good business models through our Good Business Festival, which again pivoted to an online festival, but we're looking forward to meeting face to face over the summer. For our social trading organisations, we launched an innovation fund, a social innovation fund called Kindred. And Kindred aims to grow the individual and collective impact of the social economy in Liverpool city region. It does that 
in two ways. Through its membership, a collaborative peer-to-peer -peer support network to develop and grow the impact of the sector across the city region, but also through its money. It invests in the social economy to help them grow and multiply their impact. Kindred's approach is unique for many reasons. It's owned by its community for the benefit of its community. It's being developed by and with over 150 socially trading organisations and businesses across our city region, co-designed and co-developed. While it received money from Liverpool City Region Combined Authority and Power to Change, it's independent of them both. It's designed to offer new kinds of money and support that's not currently available to the sector in the region. The money Kindred invests will be used time and time again as the businesses we invest in pay it forward within the sector. And finally, the collected value will be measured by the social impact of the investment, not just the financial returns on investment. And finally, for our community and voluntary organisations, those that don't trade or trade very little, we knew we needed to get help fast to those organisations who were in the front line supporting our communities. So we established LCR Cares, a charity working with our community partners to create a crowdfunding platform and a simple and fast grant-based system for our local community organisations. We set it up within 48 hours of the first lockdown. I think I breached some governance requirements, but needs must. LCR Cares aims to act fast and get small grant to community organisations really quickly. So from filling in the form to the money in the bank is less than 10 days. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen a rise in micro volunteering organisations and hyper local initiatives. And our small grants have helped support those new and emerging organisations, as well as supporting and sustaining the infrastructure network across our sector. And as lockdown is released, our work on this will continue. So as our economy begins to unlock for hopefully the final time, where do we go now? Well, we have elections taking place on May the 6th and our Metro Mayor will be standing for a second term of office. If re-elected, Steve Rotherham has given a commitment to continue the work with the sector through supporting Kindred as it develops, but also creating a new permanent mayoral charity. And in addition to that, he's given a commitment to create a new fund, the Voluntary and Community Sector Resilience and Capacity Fund, to develop the sector's long-term capacity and resilience that have been massively hit by COVID. The sector have been stretched, and their financial reserves have dried up. So they absolutely need a long-term support package. And the social and solidarity economy panel that we established just before COVID, who came into their own during the pandemic, will continue to give a voice in the sector for many years to come. So thank you for the invitation. I hope that gives you an insight into what our city region has tried to do to support our social and solidarity economy. And I think now we have some time where hopefully with the assistance of a translator, I'll be able to answer some questions. 
Uh, thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it is uh, amazing how many different programs and models of support uh, you have created. So uh, please uh, ask your questions uh, if you have any of uh, people in the audience. Uh, maybe to, uh, to, uh, to, to make it a little bit closer to us, uh, to give one or two examples of um, uh, uh, support from, from Kindred. What kind of uh, businesses or uh, uh, work you supported to, through this uh, channel? Certainly. Um, I'll begin by talking about a community cafe that was established, and this was prior to COVID. So um, a social entrepreneur in one of our local areas um, was working at a local college and identified that asylum seekers who were attending the college to learn English um, were struggling to find work uh, and engage in their local community. So she uh, set up a local community cafe that's staffed and run by asylum seekers. Uh, the cafe is based in a local community centre, so it gives the workers there an opportunity to engage with their local community and make those connections and overcome some of those barriers. And Kindred has been a real help, not only in providing some financial support to the project, but connecting her in one of our ex uh, more distant local authorities into the hub of social activity in Liverpool city centre, where these kinds of initiatives have been established for some time. And I know that she has found it really useful to be able to connect through Kindred, to attend some of the sessions Kindred have set up, to draw on the peer-to-peer -peer support that Kindred has been able to give, to develop the concept of her cafe. The aim now, as we come out of lockdown, is for uh, new cafes in city centre locations to develop the concept further. Um, and we're really excited to be working with the project in St Helens in the local area um, that it's been developed. So that perhaps is, is one example of a really new initiative. Um, another initiative in one of our outlying boroughs was a project called So Halton. S-E-W, as in sewing stitches, um, and they'd set up a hub for local community artists and designers to drop into a space, um, develop their work, try to create uh, their business model around fashion. Um, as the pandemic hit, uh, there was a massive need to support those in care homes and in the NHS with personal protective equipment. So that project was able to change its business overnight and start to make uh, personal protective equipment, aprons, face masks, and supply them both to local care homes, but also to other community organisations who were doing outreach work and going into our community to deliver food, to deliver medicines. So a really good example of a kind of circular economy in a really local area where a business changed its business model and was able to support other charity and community organisations. So perhaps they're two of the most recent examples. Good, thanks. Uh, also, we have another question. Uh, you were mentioning uh, if, uh, if we are right, uh, fair employment charter. So this is also very uh, unique and not so very often uh, approach regarding uh, public authority. Usually it is left over for business to, to, you know, to take care of working conditions. But can you maybe explain us a little bit more what is uh, the meaning and purpose of fair employment charter and, uh, and how you run it? Certainly. So in our city region, we have a socialist mayor and in his first manifesto in 2017, he committed to not just being a pro-business mayor, 
but a pro good business mayor. And part of that was to promote fair employment. So over the last couple of years, we've been working with trade unions, with businesses, with community organisations, with government organisations such as ACAS, who are our statutory body who promotes industrial relations, to develop a charter. And that was launched in February. The charter covers healthy work, fair work, inclusive work, and what we call just work. And that's where we talk about workplace justice in terms of staff having the right to join a trade union and have a voice at work. So there's four strands of the charter. Employers can uh, approach us to become an aspiring fair employer. And we'd ask them to start at that stage to audit their practices. And then we have an accreditation stage. So to become an accredited fair employer, they would have to meet certain standards. And that covers um, paying a real living wage, recognising trade unions, not using zero hours contracts, eliminating bad practices in terms of equality and diversity. So accredited employers would have a stamp, a badge that told people that they'd reach those standards. Now, ultimately, the power of a municipal authority having a charter like this is being able to write that charter into procurement and commissioning processes. And that's where we want to head with our Fair Employment Charter. So that would be, if you want investment money from Liverpool City Region, do you agree to sign up to our charter? If we're commissioning services, as we do for things like adult education, for housing, will we write into the process of commissioning a requirement to sign up to our charter? And that's where we want to head. That's the next stage of the charter. We've launched it as a voluntary process, but we hope to create an enforceability around those standards going forwards. And there's a little bit of a movement of this, uh, both in the UK. We've signed a similar charter with the Met Metropolitan Mayor of Manchester and London. Um, but also there's a global movement around this. So we were supported the Decent Work Cities Forum, which launched some time back. Uh, and we know of other cities taking this approach. And we'd obviously welcome direct contact with any cities in Croatia who are thinking of adopting a similar approach. Thank you. Uh, any more, any another question? That we have. Okay, thank you, uh, Lynn, for your time and for your inspiring uh, talk. Uh, we will stay in touch and hopefully see you sometimes again. Hopefully in real life one yeah. day. Yeah, take care. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye. Bye. Okay, we have now a short pause for the and we the final session of
ima hoću mogu. Dobar dan svima, evo srdačan pozdrav i gledateljima koji nas prate preko društvenih mreža. Došli smo u završni dio današnjeg programa konferencije o dobroj ekonomiji. Moje ime je Marko Ircegović iz Udruge gradova i danas ću pomoći moderirati raspravu koja nam je sada na programu na temu kako u Hrvatskoj do javnih politika za društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju. Drago mi je da su s nama danas dva gradonačelnika gradova koji su aktivno sudjelali u ovome projektu u partnerstvu sa ZMAG-om, pa ćemo imati priliku iz prve ruke čuti koje su to bile aktivnosti, koje su to bile lekcije koje su gradovi naučili na tom svom putu, koji su to izazovi, prilike ili prepreke koje stoje u Hrvatskoj drugim gradovima na njihovom putu. Pa evo, pozdravljam Marka i Dubravka, možemo krenuti sa Markom. Marko, molim vas, možete li nam pojasniti koja je uloga bila grada pregrade, odnosno koja je bila motivacija grada pregrade da uđe u jedan projekt koji promovira i jačva dobru ekonomiju? Hvala lijepo. Ja vas sve najsrdačnije pozdravljam u svoje osobno ime ispred grada pregrade. Naravno, pozdravljam sve koje nas i prate online. Pa mislim, mi u gradu Pregrade imamo već jednu, reći ću, dužu malo tradiciju toga da se uključujemo u istinu ovakve projekte. Dakle, nismo lokalna jedinica koja isključivo radi na infrastrukturi, dakle na cestama, javnoj rasvijeti, dječjem vrtiću, nego svačamo važnost upravo uključivanja u ovakve projekte i aktivacije naših projekta građana u njima, jer mislim da je ovo jedan sjajan primjer i drago mi je zapravo da smo mogli biti dio toga, jer smo svjesni da su nam potrebne i određene promjene koje se odnose na cijelokupni, pa reći ću i naš ekonomski sustav koji mora ići upravo u ovom smjeru što ovdje i stoji i što stoji u naslova, to je solidarna ekonomija. Zato je, evo, zacrtali smo si tako nešto i u našem strateškom planu, da ćemo poticati i solidarnu ekonomiju i društveno poduzetništvo i upravo ovaj program nam je došao sjajno i drago mi je da smo bili dio njega i naučili smo jako puno toga. U istinu izrodilo se nešto što je konkretno, a to je projekt zelene tržnice gdje smo kroz akcijski plan zapravo si zacrtali korake za sljedeće razdoblje utvrdili koje su nekakva zadruženja i nas kog rada, ali i ljudi koji će biti uključeni u taj projekt i vjerujemo u njegovu realizaciju, jer tako nešto nam je i više nego potrebno u gradu Pregradi, a reći ću i na nekakvom širom području, pa i u cijeloj Krapinsko-Zagorskoj županiji, gdje imamo nekoliko manjih tržnica, ali sigurno ne toga obima i ne napravljene na taj način. Dakle, a to je da već od početka, od same kreacije te zelene tržnice, pitamo potrošače što im treba, pitamo proizvođače što im treba i na taj način zapravo vjerujem stvaramo jedan prostor koji će biti fizički, a vjerujem i virtualan, gdje će stvarno i jedni i drugi maksimizirati svoje zadoljstvo i svoje potrebe koje imaju definitivno. Naučili smo jako puno, evo drago mi je da taj upitnik s kojim smo krenuli u taj kompletni projekt, gdje smo mi kao lokalna samuprava dobili, reći ću jednu vrlo dobru povratnu informaciju, jer ste išli na jedan afirmativan način. Dakle, ako na afirmativan način pitate ljude koliko su zadovoljni sa svojom lokalnom sredinom, onda zapravo dobijete i takve odgovore i meni je to drago i to mi je jedan podstrek dalje kao kao gradonačelniku da se i dalje uključujemo u ovakve i slične 
projekte da aktiviramo naše građane, naše udruge, naše, evo u ovom konkretnom slučaju, OPG-ove, gospodarstvenike, dakle da se isto uključuju u društvene projekte, da ne misle isključivo na svoje poduzeće i na profit. Imamo i tu sjajnih primjera o kojima možemo kasnije, gdje su se također oni aktivirali i ono što se nadam, naravno da će ovaj projekt stvarno zaživjeti i osigurati jednu novu potrebnu uslugu za građane grada Pregrade, a i šire okolice. Marko, hvala. Kažu uvijek da je prvi korak najteži, nakon toga ide sve puno jednostavnije. Dubravko, Ludbreg je drugi grad koji je od hrvatskih partnera sudjelo na ovome. Koji su bile vaše aktivnosti, koji su zapravo bile vaša motivacija za sudjelovanje? Pa evo, zapravo pozdravljam prije svega sve i u ime grada Ludbrega i u svoje osobno ime i zahvaljujem se Zmagu da nam je omogućio da sudjelujemo u ovom projektu. Ludbreg je jedna specifična sredina na sjeveru zemlje, jedan mali industrijski grad s gotovo nultom stopom nezaposlenosti, grad koji ima bogatu tradiciju i poljoprivredne proizvodnje, Evo, malo ljudi zna da ovo belupo znači dvije riječi zapravo povezane sa Ludbregom, bednja Ludbreg, to je kombinat poljoprivredni i lu Ludbreg i po podravka, znači belupo je osnovan upravo na tim temeljima. I ta tradicija poljoprivredne proizvodnje je zapravo polako se pretvarala u ovo veliko ratarstvo, a mi smo se željeli okrenuti nekim drugim idejama, zapravo proizvodnje zdrave hrane, ekološke hrane, ekološki ispravne, da tako kažem, hrane, koja bi omogućila našem intenzivno zaposlenom stanovništvu da što lakše dođe do domaćih poljoprivrednih proizvoda. Već smo ranije proveli jedan projekt sa slovenskim partnerima koji je bio fokusiran na identifikaciju poljoprivrednih, domaćih poljoprivrednih proizvoda i njihovu distribuciju. Projekt Zeleno želimo i na temelju toga iskustva i osnivanja poljoprivredne zadruge na području grada Ludbrega, gdje je zapravo grad bio jedan od važnijih oslonaca u tom procesu. Vidjeli smo svoju priliku da naučimo nešto i o poljoprivrednih, tome kako drugi rješavaju ove probleme dostave hrane. I ja sam osobno fasciniran onim što smo vidjeli u Ženevi, na način na koji funkcionira ta cijela priča i kroz našu zadrugu, inkubator, ali i kroz poseban angažman naših udruga, našeg civilnog sektora, zapravo mislim da smo udarili dobre temelje da se ta priča dalje razrađuje u gradu Ludbregu. Veselim se novim projektima kojima ćemo zapravo potvrditi sve ovo što smo imali priliku naučiti i vidjeti i naučiti od stranih partnera, naučiti od zmaga u kom smjeru se treba kretati, s obzirom da jesmo industrijsko mjesto, dakle gdje je vlasnicima prije svega profit važan, ali kroz ovaj projekt imali smo priliku vidjeti što je to solidarna ekonomija, u kojem smjeru ona ide, na koji način možemo kao građani razmišljati i utjecati na promjene ne samo u Ludbregu, nego i u širem okruženju, i zato je vrijednost ovoga projekta zapravo za nas nemjerljiva i nadam se da su to građani imali priliku vidjeti i osjetiti, ali da će i kroz nove projekte u svakom slučaju imati dodatnu priliku svojim angažmanom, osobnim građanskim aktivizmom utjecati na okretanje trendova i u gospodarstvu i stvaranja jednog senzibiliziranijeg društva, jedne zajednice koja zna što je to solidarnost, zna što je to društvena odgovornost i na taj način zapravo odgajati generacije koje dolaze. Hvala. Pitanje zapravo za za obojicu. Mi kada govorimo ovdje na primjeru solidarne ekonomije, zapravo 
Oba grada koriste recimo poljoprivredu, zdravu hranu kao nekako polazišnu točku. Koji je tu zapravo bitan sastojak, odnosno onaj osnovni korak da bi uvijek uopće mogli osigurati uspješan početak takve jedne inicijative? Mi se često suočavamo sa nekakvim ocjenama, koliko gotovo ne bile ili ne utemeljene, da tu postoje nekako nepovjerenje prema vlasti, da su poduzetnici generalno neskloni za nekakve vidove organizacije i sl. Kako je to išlo kod vas? Marko, evo možete. Ako me pitate, znači, ok, mi smo sad napravili taj akcijski plan, da li me pitate, nisam sad shvatio šta ćemo sad dalje, ili me pitate... Šta je to uspješan element? Koji je to element bio koji je zapravo doveo do te uspješne soradnje da se sad može krenuti dalje? Aha, pa mislim da su prvenstveno ljudi najvažniji. Dakle, ljudi koje imamo u gradskoj upravi, naravno i u našim udrugama, koji se žele uključivati u takve projekte. Dakle, da njih nemamo, onda nema niti smisla ulaziti u sve to. Ali za to morate vi imati naravno i volju u samoj gradskoj upravi, pa polazići od mene kao gradonačnika, do najbližih suradnika, da imamo želju da idemo u to, da imamo i kapacitete. Jedino na taj način možete i ulaziti u takve projekte, jer oni naravno zatjevaju određeno vrijeme, energiju, a to je ponekad i teško. Gledajte, svi smo mi mali sustavi. Recimo u gradu Pregrad imamo deset zaposlenih, sve skupa. Dakle, dva upravna odjela, ali ti ljudi rade zapravo sve. Sad, ja ono što tu očekujem od nas, u redu, postavili smo neki temelj, jasno nam je da ne ide ništa bez financija, dakle, da osiguramo i određeni financijski dio, a onda vjerujem da možemo dati, ako dati taj jedan podstrek proizvođačima, koji su vam tu na neki način ključni, da se oni kroz vrijeme znači snaju i samo organizirati, dakle, da li će to biti u vidu nekakve zadruge ili nečega drugoga, jednostavno da onda razvijaju taj svoj posao. Ali mislim da nismo tu krenuli mi, znači, to je zadatak također lokalne samouprave. Dakle, zadatak lokalne samouprave je da aktivira na svom području, dakle, zadatak lokalne samouprave je i da radi na razvoju. Bilo to gospodarski razvoj, bio to nekakav društveni razvoj, znači da razvija svoj kraj. A jedino može na taj način. Normalno, morate imati određene resurse, mi isto imamo nekakvu i tradiciju bavljenja poljoprivredom, makar nismo baš previše ravničarski kraj, dakle, kod nas više prevladava uzgoj voćarstvo, posebno vinogradarstvo, nešto ima i stočarstvo i tu vidimo nekakve perspektive za razvoj i naravno razvoj turizma koji ima velike potencijale u budućnosti, ali koji onda traži i ovaj vid ekološke proizvodnje. Ključno je zapravo to partnerstvo sa građanima koje se stvara, kako je Marko rekao, zapravo po funkciji samih jedinica lokalne zajednice i to povjerenje koje postoji između među građanima, zapravo među civilnim društvom, među gospodarstvom, poduzetnicima, rezultira onda i uspješnim projektima. Ja moram reći da smo mi kao grad u zadnjih osam godina naučili naše i građane na bavljenje europskim projektima, na promišljanje o Europi, na njihov osobni angažman koji je nužan u svakom projektu i moram priznati da nije bilo teško zainteresirati sugrađane da sudjeluju u ovom projektu. I to je zapravo dobar znak za budućnost. Mi smo krenuli sa našom zadrugom, sa desetak članova, sa puno nepovjerenja, ali kroz je predan, ozbiljan rad. Došli smo do preko 60 članova zadruge koja je najveći zapravo partner Podravke u proizvodnji povrća lokalno u blizini same tvornice, što isto tako omogućuje zapravo taj kratki lanac od berbe, od zemlje do konačnog proizvoda 
I kad ljudi jednom osjete zapravo da mogu imati povjerenje prema nekim procesima, onda ih i oni sami njeguju, sami ih razvijaju, sudjeluju u njima i to je na neki način ono što solidarno društvo i treba činiti, okrenuti se samome sebi prije svega, pronalaziti što više resursa unutar sebe, a hrana je zapravo idealan proizvod da tu cijelu priču pokrenete upravo na ovim principima, s obzirom da često znate od koga kupujete, što kupujete, kakva mu je kuhinja ili kakva mu je dnevna soba i možete s punim povjerenjem onda kupiti i taj sir sa onom punom vjerojatnošću da je to ispravno, zdravo, čisto, onako kako vi želite. Problema naravno puno ima, ali evo, uz ono što možda nama najviše nedostaje svima u Hrvatskoj, a to je povjerenje u nas same, i ima puno dobrih sredina u Hrvatskoj koje ne vide što rade. Dakle, koje ne vide koliko dobro rade i onda im mora netko doći sa strane i reći ljudi, vi to dobro radite, samo nastavite tako i bit će, evo, još ćemo nešto malo to uštimati i bit će to onako kako treba. Zato su ovi projekti izvanredni kao prilika da se potvrdite, da kažete, aha, pa mi to tako radimo. Gle, već to negdje postoji. I evo, još jednom se zahvaljujem zapravo mogućnosti da se uspoređujemo sa drugima, mogućnosti da učimo od drugih, ali i da drugi nešto nauče od nas. I taj međusobni odnos stvara jedno samopouzdanje grada kao sredine, što je jako, jako bitno da postoji ta strast i ljubav prema svome gradu, da kažete da mi smo dobri, ali možemo biti još bolji. I to je temelj na kojem gradimo budućnost. Hvala na tome. Da, evo, iz svog iskustva mogu zapravo reći da mnogo razni projekti, programi na kojim Hrvatski grado i sudjeluju sa stranim kolegama, dolaze do njima taj efekt obostranog učenja. To je nešto što mi ispred udruge gradova volimo istaknuti. Mi imamo zbilja gradove sa dobrim praksama, a da toga nismo niti svjesni. Zadržao bi se još malo na ovoj temi participacije, uključivanja dionika za za bilo koji cilj, u ovom našem slučaju solidarna ekonomija. Na temelju vašeg dosadašnjeg iskustva, koliko smatrate da je nužno institucionalizirati taj oblik suradnje sa civilnim sektorom, sa poduzetničkim sektorom i sl. Zašto je to pitanje postavljeno? Možemo se vratiti malo na ovaj primjer. Dakle, u pregradi je nedavno završen projekt Urbakta koji se promovira u volontiranje, međugeneracijska solidarnost u gradu i sl. Ono što se nama u stručnom službu udruge gradova jako svidjelo što ste vi po okončanju tog projekta odlučili lokalnu grupu dionika na neki način institucionalizirati tako što ste je ustrojili kao, ako se ne varam, savjetodavno tijelo, radnu grupu za gradsko vijeće. Da li je to zapravo neka preporuka, odnosno nekakav smjer u kojem bi se trebalo ići dalje da jednom kad su uspostavljene nekakve bazične odnosi povjerenja, da onda tu grad, lokalna jedinica izađe, napravi još jedan iskorak i na neki način uključi te dionike malo jače, malo aktivnije u cijeli rad odlučivanje i promišljanje lokalne samoprave. Pa mislim da bi smisao svakog projekta, pa i ovog kojeg ste spomenuli Urbah, ali i ovoga isto, također trebao biti da nakon što on završi, dakle da mi moramo, ovo što si ti rekao, napraviti onda stvarno jedan iskorak i da nam je taj projekt samo nekakav temelj za nešto bolje, za neki novi projekt, za neku novu aktivnost, za nešto što će biti kvalitetnije nego što je bilo ono prije. Mislim da bi tako svaki projekt trebao funkcionirati. I upravo iz Urbahta smo nešto naučili, kroz njega, zapravo kad smo ga provodili, počeli su ljudi više komunicirati. Ne kažem da nisu prije komunicirali. Komunicirali su i naša srednja škola i Crveni križ i osnovna škola, ali ne na taj način. 
Dakle, po prvi put smo kroz njega uspjeli aktivnije uključiti i poduzetnike u tu nejakú priču sa volontiranjem, pa sme imali crowdfunding kampanju, kde sme skupljali sredstva dakle, za izgradnju tenijskih terena i skupili 400 tisuća kuna. Najviše, zahvaljujući angažmanu poduzetnika, koji su dali u tih 400 tisuća kuna jedno 75-80% sredstava kroz svoje nejaké donacije, ale u nešto, što je išlo isključivo u društveno dobro. Dakle, oni su mogli, to je primjer, znači mogli su samostalno izgraditi taj tenijski teren i tamo igrati tenis, ale nisu nego su rekli dajte nam zemljište gradsko, mi ćemo ga tamo napraviti, odnosno dati najveći dio sredstava za njega. Da, mislim da je i ovo što si prvo rekao, mislim da je jako važno također i uključivanje na svim razinama, dakle svih dionika od udruga do mladih, evo mi smo provodili prvi participativni proračun za mlade zajedno sa gradom Krapinom, gradom Klanjcem i, i Zabukom. Jedan sjajan odaziv je bio od strane mladih ljudi gdje se isto često govori e, mladi su neaktivni, ne možemo ih nikako uključiti u procese e, odlučivanja jer to njih ne zanima. To nije istina. Mlade ljude to zanima, ali naravno da morate koristiti danas neke i alate, da morate koristiti nekakav pristup, pa i njihov jezik kakav je primjeren nekakvom aktualnom trenutku, dakle jezik s kojim oni komuniciraju, da bi mogli njih privući i uključiti ih. I dati im ono što stvarno oni žele. Ne možete u proračunu, ok, mi smo osigurali stavku za mlade 100.000 kuna i to je to, pa neka oni sad napravit ćemo im jedno igralište i u redu neko ima i to igralište. A možda oni ne žele to igralište, možda žele baš raditi nekakav, ne znam, koncert ili možda ne žele nogometno igralište koje ste napravili, neko žele recimo skate park. Govorim samo primjere. Dakle, stvar je da treba građane slušati, da, o, da iz ovakvih projekata stvarno treba nešto naučiti što će ostati kao trajna, trajna vrijednost e, e, zajednice. Dakle, to bi trebao biti smisao projekata. Naravno da je lijepo kad ste u projektu, kad ga provodite, kad razmijenjate e, iskustva, kad napravite kroz taj projekt nešto vidljivo, ali to sve prođe. Ako ona ostane kao nekakva e, nešto što će stvarno onda da se iz njega izrodi kao što se izrodila ova naša ovaj, grupa, dakle, iz, iz Urbahta, koja sam siguran da će u budućnosti još napraviti puno kvalitetnih i dobrih e, projekata za dobrobit pregrade. Zapravo smo promišljali isto o ovom problemu, dakle, najlakše je projekt prijaviti, dobiti ga i onda nešto malo napora treba da se taj projekt i provede, ali što kasnije? Međutim, mi, se, mi smo se odlučili zapravo za intenzivnije partnerstvo sa civilnim društvom u toj cijeloj priči i preuzeli smo zapravo na neki način inicijativu. Nakon završetaka projekta, mi te udruge koje sudjeluju u projektima vodimo dalje kroz sljedeće projekte. Dakle, naš ured za projekte i europske fondove zapravo cijelo vrijeme prati udruge civilnog društva, piše im projekte, prijavljuje ih, da li na natječaje ministarstva, da li na natječaje e, Interrega ili Erasmusa, ili uglavnom održavamo stalno tu visoku razinu aktivnosti civilnog društva, jer smo zaključili zapravo da je njima najveći problem administrativni kapacitet. Dakle, oni e, nemaju vlastite mogućnosti pisati projekte i, i brinuti o onom administrativnom dijelu. Najbolji primjer je naša udruga umirovljenika za koje smo, za koje smo zapravo odradili jedan interreg projekt sa Slovencima i Mađarima, Medgen Borza, dakle međugeneracijsko sudjelovanje kroz koji smo opremili, uredili jedan boravak, zapravo dnevni boravak za umirovljenike. Kroz sam projekt smo organizirali i prehranu za ljude koji su slabijeg imovinskog stanja i mnoge druge sadržaje i taj prostor kontinuirano nakon završetka projekta živi već godinama na različitim projektima i u partnerstvu naravno sa gradom. I to nam je zapravo i ideja da civilno društvo ima partnera u nama kao instituciji, a mi preuzimamo na sebe taj administrativni dio, u suradnji s njima prijavljujemo, tražimo projekte, učimo ih kako se ta cijela priča radi i mislim da gotovo da nema ni jedne udruge civilnog društva koja nije sudjelovala na nekom projektu, koja nije putovala, koja nije primala prijatelje iz Europe, 
i na taj način smo zapravo stvorili tu aktivnost koja nije isključivo povezana sa onim pojmom biti zaposleni i raditi, nego se zapravo stvara ta društvena mreža i poznanstava i pomaganja i međusobnog sudjelovanja i to nam zapravo daje, da tako kažem, tu snagu kao grada i na to sam ja moram priznati posebno ponosan u cijeloj, u cijeloj ovoj priči oko europskih projekata. To smo zapravo mogli vidjeti, ne, to je nekakva zajednička tema, poruka cijelog, cijelog današnjeg zapravo programa, ta suradnja sa, sa civilnim sektorom, sa udrugama, sa, sa, sa poduzetnicima i zapravo moći koja, koja lokalna samuprava ima da, da organizira i usmjeri taj proces. Prije ranije danas smo imali um, kolegu iz, iz uh, Lag Laure, iz, iz Biograda. Uh, ja se inače Ivana uh, sjećam još iz ranih dana kada je ispred grada krenuo uh, u provođenje malih projekata uh, town twinninga, dakle suradnje sa, sa stranim općinama i tako. I to bi, to bi uglavnom bili projekti koji su, mi opisujemo, Uh, ono, uh, pučka veselica, nešto se pojede, malo zasvira i, i slično. Uh, mnogi su tad uh, bili, recimo, skeptični prema ulozi takvih uh, projekata, ali ovako, sad kad možemo napraviti neku retrospektivu, zapravo se čini uh, da su čak, da su zapravo ti projekti, uh, na izgled mali, soft, uh, nužni u onome što govorimo uh, u izgradnji, izgradnji povjerenja. To su za nas isto posebno dragi projekti, nisu samo veliki projekti ono što čine, čini gradove, naravno svi smo orijentirani i na projekte od 10, 20, 50 milijuna kuna ili više, međutim mi smo u gradu odlučili zapravo posebnu pažnju posvetiti tim projektima koji se čine na oko beznačajnima, koji stvaraju prijateljstva i koji zapravo stvaraju jednu bazu potencijalnih partnera za daljnje projekte koji mogu biti puno ozbiljniji i e, puno izdašniji u onom infrastrukturnom, ali i u nekom drugom, e, drugom smislu. Međutim, ovi projekti su e, dobri projekti i to možete vidjeti kad krene autobus pun ljudi e, u neku susjednu zemlju ili nešto malo dalje, i, i kad se vrate obogaćeni iskustvom, ali i kad nakon nekog vremena vas zovu, ha, možete, možete nam biti partner na nekom od projekata. Naravno, naravno da je to onda taj konačni rezultat i ja mislim da ne postoje ni jedan mali projekt, svaki projekt je zapravo projekt koji ima svoje koristi i koji u konačnici može donijeti nešto što mi ovaj čas ne vidimo. Ali takav je u stvari i život. Kad bi se borili samo i stremili samo velikim stvarima, propustili bi zapravo sve ono što na kraju puta čini naše život bogatim. Tako je i ova priča o projektima i biranju projekata zapravo isto jedna jako gusto tkana mreža, a upravo tu čvrstoću mreže čine ovi mali projekti, projektići, druženja, koji razvijaju taj osjećaj solidarnosti, osjećaj pripadnosti i zato su nam jako važni. Um, polako smo ušli u završnicu uh, naše rasprave, evo otvoren poziv za, za sve koji nas prate, ako imate kako pitanje za naše gradonačelnike, uh, možete ih uputiti, pa evo molim, molim uredništvo da nam onda pomogne uh, oko, oko toga. Um, Pitanje, dakle, sad smo čuli koje su prednosti, koje su um, jake strane uh, ovih projekata jačanja uh, društvene i, i solidarne ekonomije. Uh, ne možemo imati ovakvu, ovakvu diskusiju ako ne istaknemo im probleme. Uh, dakle, uh, u, kada pogotovo govorimo o, o dobroj ekonomiji, koje su to stvari s kojima se gradovi susreću, a koji im predstavljaju svojevrsnu prepreku 
ili nekako otežavajuću okolnost da bi uspješno razvijeli tu taj lokalni ekosustav, da ga tako nazovemo po pitanju društvene ekonomije. Da li su to zakoni? Da li je to nedostatak sredstava? Ok, dotakli smo pitanje povjerenja, na to se ne moramo orijentirati. Da li je tu potrebna i da li može uopće tu više razine vlasti pomoć kako gradovima u nastanju da ojačaju solidarnu ekonomiju? Pa sigurno da je to pitanje zapravo za državu. Naravno da smo svi mi volimo reći da sve promjene kreću iz lokalne razine, međutim moramo biti svjesni nekakvih kapaciteta koje imamo, da naravno svi moramo poštivati zakonsku regulativu koja nam zapravo diktira sve i što moramo raditi, koja nam diktira i sredstva s kojima raspolažemo kompletne naše obaveze. Dakle, bez promjene, ja ću reći, jedne paradigme kako imamo na razini cijele Hrvatske, pa i mislim da i na razini Europske unije, teško je ovaj... Teško da će doći do onih nekakvih velikih pomaka kakvi se očekujemo. Ovo jesu mali, ovo jesu lijepi koraci i dobri u svakom slučaju, međutim za nešto više, a to je stvarno da se više recimo građana bavi sa nekom ekološkom proizvodnjom, da od nje živi, trebamo ipak jedan okvir na nekoj nacionalnoj, pa možda i nadnacionalnoj razini. Mislim da sve ovo što radimo kroz ove projekte, sve ove nekakve i prijedloge koje šaljemo, koji postoje, bi trebao nekog ordena, to je više instanci, ipak uzeti u obzir i napraviti jednu smislenu strategiju. Dakle, vođenje politike na lokalnoj razini je nešto sasvim drugčije od vođenja politike na nacionalnoj razini, gdje morate onda pratiti i specifičnosti određenog razina bilo koje politike, dakle, govorim, ne morate onda i pratiti nekoj specifičnosti, povijest, tradiciju određenog kraja. Tako da, definitivno to je. Naravno da su se i stilovi života promijenili, moramo biti i toga također svjesni, da danas dobar dio naših stanovnika radi ili negdje u proizvodnim pogodnima, da radi u uslužnim djelatnostima, što nije u nikakvoj koliziji sad, dakle neko ko radi u uslušnim djelatnostima, vrlo dobrim povezivanjem sa ekološkim proizvođačima, primjenice jedan i drugi mogu egzistirati. Ali da nam tu fali, ja ću reći onako jedne konkretne smislene politike oko toga, definitivno fali, makar ima potica, naravno. Od grada, od županije, pa do nacionalne razine, evo fondovi ovdje također pružaju dosta velike mogućnosti, no međutim, još uvijek onaj mali proizvođač smatram da ipak nema te mogućnosti kao što ima veliki. Još uvijek je to usmjereno prema velikima, a jako kao gledam i tu cijelu priču oko solidarne ekonomije i svega, je da je ipak okrenuta prema manjem proizvođaču, prema onome koji će raditi to na nekoj manjoj parceli. Naravno, ja govorim sa aspekta Krapinsko-Zagorske županije i konfiguracije terena, pa i tradicije kakva tamo postoji. Dakle, mi teško da ćemo imati nekog vinara koji će imati, ne znam, kako je recimo postoje u Slovoniji i Dalmaciji, jer jednostavno nemamo toga prostora. Ali činjenica je da možemo imati sjajnih malih vinara koji će proizvoditi odlično vino, ali ne u tim količinama. Ali onda bi ono trebalo naravno imati puno veću vrijednost i trebalo bi onda prema njima i nekakve mjere usmjeriti, a ne da su mjere iste za cijelu državu. I za Zagorje i za Slavonije. To su ipak različite priče, samo na jednom takvom ipak manjem prostoru ako gledamo cijelu Europu kao što je Hrvatska. Pa sigurno da ima problema, međutim ovi mali projekti pod navodnicima, mali niše Erasmusa i različitih ovakvih prekograničnih suradnji zapravo pokazuju na koji način ta cijela priča treba funkcionirati i može funkcionirati jer oni ne iscrpljuju kapacitete gradova i općina na način kako to rade ovi veliki projekti koji su zapravo 
posloženi da mnoge jedinice lokalne samouprave ne mogu se uopće prijaviti, nisu jake, dovoljno niti financijskim kapacitetom, niti imaju ljudskih resursa. Mi smo mali grad, ali smo se u jednom trenutku odlučili napraviti vlastiti taj europski ured, da tako kažem, projektni tim koji ima šest ljudi koje treba plaćati, naravno, i kad donesete takvu odluku, onda morate plivati tom strujom i raditi projekte. Mi sad trenutno imamo blizu 3 milijuna kuna vani, kreditiramo državu. Prošle godine smo u nekom trenutku imali do 8 milijuna kuna novaca vani, što je za nas jako puno zapravo, ali ukoliko želite sudjelovati, morate igrati po tim pravilima i Marko je rekao da mi imamo pravila gdje se ne smijemo zaduživati, moramo paziti od prvog do 31. kako ćemo funkcionirati i jako je teško zapravo voziti se tom rijekom evropskih projekata i nije ni čudo da zapravo imamo problema sa povlačenjem evropskih sredstava, oslanjamo se na trgovačka društva poput Hrvatskih voda i još nekih drugih velikih sustava da nam povlače evropska sredstva, a ono gdje bi ih trebali zapravo najviše koristiti na rastu kvalitete života građana, da to rade gradovi i općine, tu zakazujemo, zato jer drugačije tu cijelu priču promišljamo nego bismo možda trebali i bilo bi nama kao gradovima, a još više općinama zapravo, lakše kad bismo se mogli bez nekog velikog straha upustiti u tu cijelu priču evropskih projekata, bez nekakvih sumničenja i ne znam nija čega i onda ljudi kažu pa ne treba nam to, ok, radit ćemo sa onim što imamo, imamo malo, imat ćemo malo, ali bar ćemo mirno spavati, nećemo ulaziti u sad kako ćemo platiti račun od 4 milijuna kuna, a za neke radove, a na računu imamo dva i moramo čekati povrat novaca 20 mjeseci. I naravno da je onda dolazi do problema. Ta priča bi se mogla puno bolje složiti na primjerima drugih evropskih zemalja i onda bi naravno ne bi se dešavalo da pred kraj ovog razdoblja financijskog mi imamo 40-50% ugovorenih sredstava koja nećemo potrošiti, koja ćemo predati nekome drugome da ih potroši, umjesto da na kraju razdoblja imamo 90% potrošenih ili 110% potrošenih sredstava i da možemo stvarno reći da je vrijedno biti član Europske unije. Ja se nadam da će se te stvari promijeniti i da ćemo lakše moći iskoristiti ono što smo dobili. Kad dobijete 100 kuna, možete s tih 100 kuna napraviti puno više nego sa 0 kuna kojih u konačnici i nemate i zato treba to koristiti na pravi način. Da, stoji što ste rekli. Ja bih samo dodao da možda jedno malo pašnjenje za naše gledatelje. Dakle, istina, da, što se tiče povlačenja europskih sredstava, tu velika državne firme, velika poduzeća, agencije, ministarstva nose znatan dio, ali odmah iza njih je zapravo lokalna samouprava kao zapravo druga skupina po veličini kada govorimo o absorpciji. Tako da tu, ja bih rekao, postoje kapaciteti, postoji volja da se krene dalje. Da li možda imamo koje pitanje da je stiglo preko interneta? Imamo tu iz publike jedno. Ako nema iz interneta, može publika. Evo, ja sam svakako baš, mislim, poznajem vaš rad, tako da znam da ste stvarno predvodnici u korištenju sredstava i nekako evropskih fondova i stavljanje u neko opće dobro. Međutim, zanima me, možda ako možete reći par rečenica o vašim iskustava s jednim drugim alatom koji se često spominje kao da je ključan za upravo podršku lokalnoj ekonomiji, a to je ono što se zove pod raznim nazivima, ono zelena javna nabava ili ne znam, lokalna javna nabava i slično gdje zapravo se kroz taj instrument kriterija najpovoljnije ekonomske ponude, a ne, koja daje najveću vrijednost zajednice, a ne najjeftinije ponude po cijeni. 
zapravo može jako puno napraviti, međutim, kad god se priča operativno o tome, onda pogotovo manje jedinice lokalne samouprave zbog izuzetne kompleksnosti procesa, jer sam proces same javne nabave je već kompleksan, a onda još ako morate definirati svoje vlastite kriterije i parametre, onda postaje još ono izuzetno kompleksan. Da li ste imali iskustva s time na području vaše jedinice lokalne samuprave, da li imate neke ideje kako bi se to moglo primjenjivati i općenito ako možete par rečenica o tome reći? Ovo je zapravo jako dobro i zanimljivo pitanje. Mi smo kao grad koji provodi dosta projekata zapravo suočeni sa velikim problemima u provođenju javne nabave. Mi trenutačno imamo dvije školovane osobe, zapravo certificirane osobe za provođenje klasične javne nabave i pripremamo se zapravo za ovo što ste vi govorili za uvođenje zelene javne nabave kao što ima čini mi se Koprivnica da to već radi. Nešto malo smo špionirali i gledali i želja nam je zapravo da potaknemo ovo što ste rekli, dakle da možemo izabrati uvijek onu ponudu koja je najbolja za našu zajednicu, koja je našoj zajednici najviše vraća i možda mi u malim sredinama to puno lakše možemo i realizirati, jer su nam i projekti obično, recimo, manji i puno više zainteresiranih domaćih ponuditelja, da tako kažem. Ali u svakom slučaju to je područje koje nama daje najviše mogućnosti da se okrenemo vlastitim resursima, da potičemo zapravo ono što imamo i mi planiramo u sljedećem periodu dakle, preuzeti taj, taj način jer vidjeli smo zapravo kroz provođenje ovih velikih nabava da je to jedan proces koji ne garantira uvijek uspjeh. Ako, evo, ako mogu ja... Slično kao, kao i kolega, ne smo provodili još zelene javne nabave u, u gradu Pregrad, jednostavno mali sustavi su, ja imam sad iskrenu situaciju da mi je prije mjesec dana otišla pročelnica upravnog odjela za društvene e, djelatnosti i opće poslove koja je bila jedini certificirani, e, koja je imala jedini certifikat za javnu nabavu. Dakle, sad sam u situaciji da moram nekog od zaposlenika dakle, da, da, da napravi ovaj kompletni e, certifikat. Mislim, to, to je tako jednostavno. Dosta aktivnosti, malo ljudi, jer nemate realno kapaciteta financijskih da više, makar bi ih trebalo zasvijek, ja sad računam kod nas u gradu sigurno, nekoliko ljudi bi još trebalo doći s obzirom na to koliko, koliko aktivnosti imate, ali morate biti u nekakvim ipak gabaritima i trošenja plaća, imate i neke zakonske, ovaj, zakonske limite koje su određene, makar smo daleko ispod ispod njih, međutim, koliko je bilo sad i fondova i korištenja svega, dakle, sredstava jednostavno nismo bili u mogućnosti. Ali to je definitivno nešto što nas čeka. Morat ćemo, morat ćemo znači, osim pričamo danas kroz o, o projektima, da se javljamo na njih i što ostaje dobro iza tih projekata i naravno razmišljamo dalje o budućnost, ali moramo, ne smijemo zanemariti taj ovaj, dio koji se odnosi na kadru, odnosno na na ljudski potencijal gdje je jako još danas teško također dobiti kvalitetne ljude da, do, da rade u lokalnoj samoupravi. Ograničeni smo sa nekakvim plaćama, dakle sa koeficijentima koje možemo dati. Vi znate kako je danas ovaj, za kvalitetnim ljudima koliko može ponuditi e, privatni sektor, da se mi tu vrlo teško možemo boriti s njima, pa čak ću reći i, 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 i državni sektor. U kraju da imaju puno i veću sigurnost i dođete u nekakav državni sustav i možete onda kroz njega i napredovati, imate sva i, i prava više zagarantirana, a ovdje vam je situacija da vam zaposlenik ponekad čak niti ne može u našim manjim sustavima na, biti na godišnjem odboru niti na bolovanju, a da nema u sebe e, mobitel i laptop i da cijelo vrijeme nije posebno ako se provodi neki, neki projekt. Dakle, tu bi isto trebali mijenjati, ali dobro, to je sad već možda jedno drugo pitanje oko kompletne e, strukture naše lokalne samouprave, njezene usitnjenosti i problema koje imaju, recimo, mi sad govorimo s pozicije nekakvih manjih gradova, ali e, dajte se misli kakve su ono probleme u nekakvim manjim općinama i na koji način će oni provoditi zelenu nabavu. Teško, teško, ne vjerujem. Znači, mi tu moramo definitivno 
početi razmišljati kako će naša lokalna samuprava izgledati za pet ili deset godina, ako želimo početi uvoditi u njeo te standarde za koje mislim da svi slažemo da su nam oni potrebni, da su dio zapravo i jedne šire priče koja se zove Europska unija, čiji smo članovi. Mi sad radimo sa, kak je Ludbreg, prilično kompaktna sredina i ta bivša općina Ludbreg, onih 120 općina na području Hrvatske, koliko je bilo vjerojatno optimalno onda, vjerojatno je bilo i sad. Imamo nekakve dogovore sa susjednim općinama da puno toga radimo zajednički i čak imamo potpisane ugovore u kojima su oni prenijeli na nas recimo neke svoje obaveze, jer je to puno lakše obaviti kod nas, jer nas ima više, nego kod njih. I mislim da je to budućnost. Zapravo to funkcionalno ili funkcijsko, kako se bude zvalo, već povezivanje, naslanjanje sredina jedni na druge, jer naš projektni ured je već toliko jak i snažan zapravo da može preuzeti to i za susjedne općine, pitanje javne nabave, isto tako, s obzirom da smo se sad i tu ojačali i mislim da je to jedan logičan i normalan slijed bez one velike pompe, ovo ćemo ukinuti, ovoga nećemo ukinuti. Mi u Ludbregu ne ukidamo ni mjesne odbore jer mislimo da su super stvar da se maksimalno spusti odlučivanje ljudi sa vlastitim budžetiranjem i zato bi ova funkcionalna priča zapravo mogla biti hit u sljedećem periodu. Ako smijem dodat na ovo pitanje vezano za javnu nabavu, ja bih spomenuo i primjer Koprivnice koja je sudjelovala u jednoj međunarodnoj mreži projektu gdje su zapravo išli na razvijanje pametnije korištenja javne nabave, kako bi se postizali ciljevi zelenog razvoja, solidarnog razvoja i drugih ciljeva koje neka lokalna samuprava može učiniti. Tako da, evo, Koprinica bi mogla biti jedan od primjera dobre prakse ili makar učitelja za druge gradove. Čini mi se evo da smo malo, malo smo prošli, malo smo prošli našu e, satnicu, ako nema e, dodatnih pitanja, ja bih zahvalio e, našim gostima, dakle evo s nama su bili e, Dubravko Bilić, gradonačelnik Ludbrega i Marko Vešligaj, e, gradonačelnik grada e, Pregrade. E, s ovim bi ja završio e, naš e, okrugli e, stol, imamo još neko e, potpisivanje e, u nastavku, tako da prepuštam e, draženu, e, draženu riječ. Hvala. Evo, hvala lijepo i bilo je baš zanimljivo slušati e, ove sve misli o izazovima i o nastavku suradnje i potencijalima. Nama sad predstoji samo možda, ajmo reći, trešnja, šlag na torti, ili kako se kaže, trešnja na torti ovog projekta što se tiče suradnja s gradovima. Pripremljena je povelja o suradnji između udruge Zmagi i gradova koji su bili uključeni u ovom projektu. Povelja je prilično jednostavna. I mogu reći ona specificira načela naše suradnje i neke ciljeve, sve zapravo što je bilo dio ovog projekta i one u neku ruku mi smo svjesni da su gradovi priča za sebe i koja se razvija, ovo je možda u neku ruku i veća obaveza za nas u zmagu da u trenucima ili kod projekata ili kad je neka potreba u samim gradovima da se ponovo pokrene neka priča sa društvenom i solidarnom ekonomijom, da zapravo imate tu stabilnog i pouzdanog partnera koji će sa zadovoljstvom odgovoriti na tu potrebu i pomoći takav razvoj, jer je to dio naše misije. Pa evo, da ja ne dužim, ja ću staviti svoje potpise, potpisujemo u dva primjerka, jedan ostaje gradovima, jedan nama i možemo se slikati.
Evo ljudi, to je bilo to. Imali smo zbilja ispunjen dan. Hvala vam svima na sudjelovanju. Ogromna hvala uredu za udruge koji je kroz švicarsko-hrvatski program suradnje financirao naš projekt i omogućio sve ovo. Naravno i zahvala švicarskoj ambasadi u Hrvatskoj što je pristala na jedan ovakav zaista inovativan inovativnu potporu u lokalnim razvojima. Nama još slijedi samo da kažem objava i tisak priručnika za javne politike za društvenu i solidarnu ekonomiju koja će biti, ja mislim, u roku od mjesec dana dostupna i na našim internetskim stranicama i ukoričena, pa će to biti jedan dobar alat za kreiranje javnih politika i sve ovo što smo danas pričali. Nadam se nekim budućim suradnjama, budućim projektima i budućem razvoju društvene solidarne ekonomije i hvala svima i do nekog sljedećeg susreta. Pozdrav.